Rogers and uh, Michael Kramer. It's going to be a really neat program of uh, music of uh, Django Reinhardt. After that will be a short break for lunch if you want to grab it, and then there's going to be a guest artist recital, which is going to feature uh, our composition competition winner, performed by Craig Mulcahy of the National Symphony. So you definitely want to make sure you catch that. That piece was originally listed on Thursday, but it's going to get performed today. So that's on the 1230 guest artist recital. I think I got my mic. Um, on we also break. have uh, some amazing concerts. We have uh, Matt Neese is going to do a presentation on Arthur Pryor, and then it's going to be accompanied by the American Army Brass Quintet. Uh, we also have uh, the Texas State University Trombone Choir. Uh, they sound fantastic. I was here last night so that they could rehearse, and they really are going to present a fantastic program. So make sure you check that out at 3.30. Uh, following that, uh, Brian Hecht is going to give a master class. And uh, again, I've had the pleasure of knowing Brian for several years. Uh, it's great to see. And he was a fantastic player when he was in town with the Navy Band, and he's continued to grow. And I really look forward to what he has to share with everybody later. And then we cap everything off with the uh, Army Orchestra concert in the evening featuring uh, Vanessa Freilich, uh, Ben McElwine, and uh, Jim Nova. And there's some fantastic music on that program, probably a lot of pieces you're not familiar with, uh, so you definitely want to check that out. Um, without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome to the stage, who's already on stage, <laughs> uh, from the University of Nebraska, Pete, Dr. Pete Madsen. Sam, thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's nice to be here. I'm going to move this down here, and you guys that are over here, please come on down. You need to be able to see either a music stand, or we could probably cram a few more people on stage here to see the screen. It's the same thing, but you kind of need to be able to see one or the other. I think you can, yeah, you can even spread out down the line there if you want to. Great. So uh, my name is Pete Madsen. I teach at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Uh, and I'm excited to share with you a, a group warm-up that I put together uh, for a couple of different reasons. At UNO, we do group warm-ups with our trumpet and trombone students every morning. And kind of as a result of doing that, uh, I, I thought, well, let's, let's try something a little bit different because the idea of doing a routine, of course, inherent in that is kind of doing the same thing over and over again. So this was born maybe not really out of boredom, but just out of a desire to try something a little bit different. Uh, in terms of a warm-up routine. So a typical warm-up routine, of course, addresses some certain things, long tones, buzzing, lip slurs, maybe high range and low range. And what I'm going to take you through today does all of that, but in kind of a different context. Our typical routine is very pattern-based, right? How many times have we done first position, second position, first position, third position, right? We all do that, and it's great and a good, necessary thing to do. Or the lip slur patterns, right? You come up with a pattern in first position, and you do the lip slur pattern. Then you do it in second position. Then you do it in third position, all through the positions. And then you do a different pattern, first position, second position. Sometimes we trombone players get really creative and crazy, and we start in seventh position and work our way up. Yeah, right. So the thing that, that came to mind was, well, we do all these patterns dealing with how the instrument works. They're based on partials, and they're based on positions. And that's a great thing to do. But what about coming up with a pattern that's based not on just the instrument, but based on a chord progression? Maybe a very common chord progression, like the B-flat blues, for instance. And my students, when they come to me at UNO from, straight from high school, most of them don't really know what a blues is. Like, like the, it, the advanced ones can get through a blues scale pretty well. But they don't really understand the harmony. So my goal in putting this together was something that would help students understand harmony, uh, within the context of a warm-up routine where you're covering all of the necessities of a, of a basic routine. So it's designed to go along with the iReal Pro app. Raise your hand if you have used the iReal Pro app. Wow! I thought there would be way more. Well, so let me talk about the app just a little bit then. So it's, uh, it's a play-along app similar to the, to the good old-fashioned Abers Abersol recordings, which I love and still use. But with the app, the benefits are you can change keys, you can put in your own chord changes, uh, and you, you can change tempos, and you can change styles. So there's all kinds of flexibility to it. It's like 12 bucks, and it comes with quite literally thousands of tunes already programmed in, and you can program in your own chord changes as well. So this is designed to go along with that. So you have basically a metronome all the time in terms of a steady tempo. You also have a pitch reference. Um, 
in terms of intonation. So without further ado, sorry, my iPad went to sleep here. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into it. So we're going to start with some long tones, all right? Your typical long tone idea, but based on the chord roots to a B flat blues. Each one of these is going to be played, or each exercise is played three times. Yeah, so flip over to, to the next page uh, if you have the paper in front of you. Uh, several of these long tone series, each one we play three times, all right? Let's play it the first time, let's sing it the second time, and let's buzz it on our mouthpiece the third time. And the reason I like to sing a little bit is for ear training purposes. Again, my students coming in can't really usually hear a B-flat blues, and so this helps get that in your ear. In this case, what do the roots sound like? And we're just doing some nice, low, long tones at the same time. And each count off is a uh, two bar count off. All right, two bar count off and jump into the long tones. Whoops. Sorry, technical difficulties here. I love and hate technology, as we all do. I think it got confused when it went to sleep. There we go. All right, two bars and we're in. background track okay? A little higher? Maybe a little higher on the backing track? Great. So the other thing is who wouldn't want to start their day with disco music, right? The disco warm-up. Uh, you guys that just came in, if, feel free to come on stage. We've got a screen up here. You can probably cram on here some more people and, and, uh, and see the screen. So uh, the next one is another long tone series. Go ahead and flip your page over. Uh, same thing, let's sing it, or sorry, play it, sing it, and buzz it. Again, what you're doing here is you're training your ear, too, in terms of guide tones in this case. If you're not familiar with that term, we jazzers use that term all the time. It refers to the third and the seventh. So not only are you doing long tones and ear training, but you're also reinforcing the idea of voice leading using guide tones. Ah. Uh -huh. 
Good. So a couple more of these long tones, again, reinforcing ear training and voice leading at the same time as you're doing your long tone exercise. Uh, those of you that just came in, we can kind of try to cram on. We could probably do two or three to a music stand. There's probably a little more room on stage. Don't be shy. Come on up. So this time we start on the seventh uh, and move down to the third. If you're unfamiliar with what that means, it's, it's um, subtly reinforcing this idea of voice leading, going from one chord tone to the next that's a close note as we do our long tone and buzzing warm up. volume okay for the playback? Good now? Okay, great. All right, one more of these where we uh, play and then sing and then buzz. Uh, this one really emphasizes the idea of common tones as you work your way through a B-flat blues chord progression while getting a great long tone series in place for a warm-up. <laughs>
all this stuff down an octave, most of it actually works really, really, really well simply taking it down an <coughs> octave. Um, another reason I put this together the way I did is when we do our group warm-ups at UNO, of course we have varying degrees of ability level. We have freshmen and we have seniors and everything in the middle. So every single exercise follows the chord tones in a B-flat blues, which means as a group you can do any exercise at the same time as any other exercise as we go through this. So if it gets to the point where some of the lip slurs near the end get somewhat advanced, if it's a little beyond where you are, feel free to just go back and do some of these long tone exercises again at the same time, and it should always work out really well. So for the next one, let's play it one time, buzz it one time, and then play it again. And the reason I like to do that uh, when I do the buzz, I like to make it nice and smooth and glissy. And I almost do like on this first measure, almost like a B flat to B flat glissando where I barely even really stop on the F. That's how I prefer to do it, to get a nice smooth transition between partials. And then the idea is on the third time through, try to maintain that same idea of smoothness and control as you go from partial to partial. So play first time, buzz on the mouthpiece, nice and glissy the second time, and play the third time. And let's mix up the style a little bit too. Let's go to, how about soul? Sweet soul music, that's the best, so I hear. Somebody knows Tower of Power in here. Uh, you can choose, obviously, if you're doing this on your own, whatever tempo you want. 120 seems to work really well for a lot of these, so I, I'll keep it there for most of the time. All right, here we go. but rather than basing the pattern on the seven positions of the trombone, it's based on the chord changes. In other words, as the chords change, you keep a similar pattern, but you just change that one or two important notes. So it's constantly reinforcing the idea of voice leading in terms of which notes are changing and which, note, which notes are staying the same. And I have it worked out, so sometimes you're moving the slide, but it's still a lip slur or a natural break, as we call it. All right. Uh, this one we just play straight down, no buzzing involved. Thank you. 
good. So for the next page, I, I like to start very gradually expanding the range, uh, but still with this idea of a pattern that follows the chord progression. So for this one, let's go back to we play it one time, we buzz it one time, making it a nice glissando type of buzz that's slow but very controlled, and then play the third time. So play, buzz, play. changes in above every single measure to help people keep track of that. I, s I thought about writing in actually every single chord tone as well, but I decided that would get a little too cluttery. But it's a great thing to be thinking to yourself as you're doing this, okay, what chord tone am I on right now? This isn't really intended to be an improvisation method by any means, but hopefully the, the um, application of that is pretty obvious. And if you're able to think to yourself, okay, now I'm on the seventh, and as the chord changes, okay, now I move a half step and now I'm on the third. Um, that can be really, really helpful in just understanding a basic concept of voice leading when it comes to B-flat blues. So for this next one, uh, no buzzing. We just play the entire thing straight down. Let's go back to where we play the first time, buzz the second time, making it nice and glissy, and then play again on the third time.
intent with all these is to play them with, with no tongue, just like a lip slur, even though you're moving the slide. Bass trombones, in just a few instances, it doesn't work out that way. You either need to throw in a, a tongue or get a gliss, whichever you prefer, actually. It doesn't matter. It's your warm up. Um, but for the tenor trombone parts, they all, they all cross natural breaks every time you're moving the slide, uh, which eventually starts to work its way, too, into the idea of some against the grain playing as part of this. All right, this one will play all the way through, uh, no buzzing. And um, if the 16th notes, uh, we have a lot of students in here, it looks like, which is fantastic. If the 16th notes are a little too fast for you, you could just do the first chorus again or the second chorus again, and it'll fit just fine and work just fine. So kind of works to all ability levels at the same time. everywhere so sometimes the pattern doesn't quite follow what you might naturally think that it does. All right, we need to change the style a little bit. How about um, how about R and B? Yeah. <coughs> a little R and B this morning. All right. Play buzz play. probably putting a little more air through, and we've added some people. Is the volume still okay on the playback? <laughs> and hopefully not blowing people away. We can just kind of keep it a mezzo piano level amongst us, since there's so many of us, and just speak up if we need the playback to go up or down. Um, we just play all the way through this next one. Oh. 
are doing a good job hanging in there. Nice work. <laughs> All right. Uh, this one almost gets into a lip trill type of idea. So we just play this one straight down. These next couple really get into the idea of against the grain playing. So everything <laughs> that you do uh, crosses a partial, yet you're moving the slide. So the idea is blow through it and just let the slide do the articulation for you. Uh, obviously a very common technique amongst jazz trombone players. So this one we uh, play one time, buzz one time, play one time. change up the style again too. How about bassa? Yeah. Bassa acoustic. Oh, we'll get to bluegrass. Don't you worry. <laughs> All right. The next one we just play it straight down. <laughs> Have fun and good luck.
uh, a little trickier, but a great example of, of against the grain playing at a fast speed once you get a chance to practice that a little bit. Nice sight reading on it, though. All right, uh, let's see if we can work our, yes, question. Uh, in terms of the app part of it? Uh, it comes with a gazillion different tunes, and this one was called Blues Simple. Yeah, th so it was, it was already programmed in, along with a bunch of other variations, okay, but this is the one that I wanted. One that was programmed in just recently, yeah, cool. happened to be program, programmed in, but it's very easy to make your own. Yeah, awesome. yeah good question. All right, let's see if we can get up to uh, high B flat in terms of some lip slurs. Uh, for this one, play the first time, buzz the second time, play the third time. to try to inter intersperse some low playing in as well. So we've got a chorus of some pretty high flexibility stuff and then just some good old fashioned low notes and some smears um, and then some eighth notes there at the, at the end of this one. So we play all the way through this one, no buzzing involved. specify for the high A flat th my personal preference I like doing that in first position just to get used to the fact that that partial is there even though of course we typically wouldn't play it in first position so if you like third position great do third position but I like first uh, we'll do one more kind of challenging high one and then we'll do some tonguing so this one brings you up to high C so in terms of chord tones it actually has you on the ninth uh, and or the thirteenth and again, interspersing some low stuff in there to try to keep us from getting too tense on all of the high playing.
skips that one, but I, I just I had to hear 60 trombone players play pedal tones all at the same time. So, but I am going to skip a couple ahead. Those of you that are looking off of paper, uh, move up to page 21, if you would. Page 21. We'll do a little bit of of tonguing here, and let's change the style and tempo just a little bit too to better accommodate the exercise. Let's see. How about a cha cha? Yeah. Cha cha cha. We'll move the metronome down to 100. And what I like to do on this one, uh, I stole directly from David Vining's book. Some of you may be familiar with those. Play the exercise the first time, and the second time, just tongue and blow air like this. Um, it gets you used to, to uh, not letting anything stop the air because you're just <laughs> blowing air. And it's also kind of a nice chop break at this point, too, because this is a pretty hefty warm-up. So play the first time, just air and tongue through the horn the second time, and then play again on the third time. with some uh, long tones in the upper register, and I've incorporated some rests, so you're really, and we go much faster, so you're really not hanging up there for too long to kill you, uh, but hopefully just a chance to try to pick some high notes out of the air and uh, try to do so without too much tension. And, um, and then the, the third of three choruses is uh, some, some low notes to try to keep you loose. And we'll be done after this. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I can answer those. And then we got to get out of the way for Harry Waters. And I heard them warming up. And you don't want to miss that. So make sure you stay right here in this room uh, when we're done. So we got to pull out the bluegrass style for this one. Yeah. Got to do bluegrass. And this one moves really quick. Quarter equals 220. So your count off is going to come in. Uh, right away, and we start on high B flat. <laughs> get a handout um, and would like it, I'd be happy to email it to you. You can jot down my email address there. Um, 
I do have plans to flesh this out into a, a book, basically, that uh, David Vining is going to publish through Mountain Peak Music. So if you found this of interest, my plan is to have about seven different chapters, sort of one for each day, and do another blues in a different key, and then the same concept with some jazz standards, again, reinforcing the idea of doing all the basics in a warm-up, but within the context of, of uh, actual music that hopefully would be beneficial to you in terms of voice leading and things like that. Um, does anybody have any questions? Everybody's either warmed up or worn out. <laughs> One of the two, maybe a little bit of both. All right, well, I know we do need to clear off kind of quickly to, uh, to get Harry Waters in here and their set up, so don't go far, but put your horns up and stick around for Harry. We don't.
Welcome, everyone. Really excited. This is kind of a traditional spot for those of you who have been coming to the trombone workshop for years. Know that this is kind of a traditional time for Harry Waters to, to do his show. Um, <coughs> if you stuck around after the Woos concert last night, who, who got to hear that fantastic little impromptu show? And who didn't? Who doesn't know what I'm talking about? Yeah. It, if you missed it, um, it, it, was, it was a blast. Um, after the Blues concert, an amazing concert with Steve Davis, um, we had Jens Lindemann showed up and set up a little combo and was joined by Harry, and they put on a, a fantastic show right here in the lobby. And it was a lot of fun. If you got to see it, you know what I'm talking about. If not, talk to the people that raised their hands earlier. It was a lot of fun. Um, so we're going to get to hear some more from Harry, and one of the things I love about Harry is, uh, I mean, everyone knows what an amazingly talented uh, trombonist he is. But what also uh, amazes me is how versatile he is. You know, I'm mostly a, a, a classical trained trombonist. I love jazz. I'm a great appreciator uh, of jazz, but I don't play it as much. And often, you know, I kind of come at it as a, more of an outsider. And I often forget the, the wide, deep uh, scope that jazz encompasses. And I think it's really interesting that Harry's going to present to you a, a very different style of uh, concert today. Um, he's going to do it with one of our newest members, uh, Staff Sergeant Michael Kramer, also from the Blues. Um, and we're really excited about this music of uh, Django Reinhardt. So please welcome to the stage guitarist Michael Kramer and trombonist Harry Waters. <laughs> Thank you. 
Michael Kramer, ladies and gentlemen. Newest member of the Army Blues. This is kind of cool. Um, if, last year I didn't get a chance to do this uh, because, well, I'll show you why. <laughs> I had three arm surgeries. You threw, wouldn't that be something? I'd be, I'd be rich. Um, three arm surgeries, and uh, there is a cadaver tendon in my arm now. And it's, it's pretty weird. Whoever wants to touch the cadaver tendon at the end, feel free to come one up. Um, but uh, so this, the, the, the first recital coming back, I wanted to have kind of low-key sitting down a chair with, with armrests. <laughs> so that's why we're doing this. But this is like old home week, and it's so great to see family and friends. Steve, thank you so much for being here. And my gosh. This is like uh, old home week for sure. Um, Django Reinhardt is a huge influence of mine because a lot of the, the tunes that he latched onto were Louisiana standards as well. Uh, so it really speaks to me because I'm from Louisiana as well. And uh, Michael, can you uh, tell the folks a little bit about wh what you love about Django from a te technical perspective and from a life perspective? Sure. Well, well, first, I actually would like to dovetail on your Louisiana point. Um, they say uh, that the first time that Django Reinhardt heard Louis Armstrong, he, he actually cried. He thought it was so beautiful that he just broke down in tears. Um, and that's the, ba that's the basis for the man. Um, technically, uh, he was an amazing guitarist. Um, in his 20s, he, uh, he was actually in a, uh, a trailer fire. Uh, he's a gypsy, a Belgian gypsy, and uh, so he lived in a, in a trailer for most of his life, and at a certain point, um, actually the story is that he was on a gig, and he came home at night, and the trailer was on fire, and his family was, some of his family was in there, and so he went in to save them, and, and, and he did, I think he, he saved everybody inside, but uh, he ended up burning um, his left hand, which is the hand that you finger the guitar, uh, so badly that he lost uh, these two fingers, they were just stubs. So he could use them to play chords, he could use the stubs to play chords, but his linear things were only this, only this much. Uh, these two, <laughs> and if you listen to the records, it's like incredible. I mean, the guy plays faster than I can play with uh, four fingers, so um, technically uh, that's probably what, what speaks to me the most. And um, emotionally, his swing is just as hard as Louie, and I just don't understand how you can get that kind of intensity out of the guitar, but that's, that's the emotional side for me, that emotional swing, it's hard. Yes. Well, you're gonna, you're gonna love Michael's playing up uh, throughout the hour today, and um, we're gonna continue on with I'm Confessing That I Love You, and this is our first public performance together, but we're gonna do a lot more. We're gonna do some, uh, hopefully a lot more playing and, and some recording as well. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna talk down some of the beginnings and endings in real time. Let's do a tag ending with a chord. Okay. All right. Here we go. And I hope everyone has the uh, the set lead sheets here. They were they were out there just so you can follow along because we don't want any secrets in jazz. The most important thing about jazz is not talent, it's curiosity. So just follow along. Here we go. And this is from uh, I Real Deal. Yeah, call out the chord if I'm playing it wrong. I'm probably so. <laughs> <laughs> One.
Avalon, Sergeant Major, I think I'm just going to shout for the, instead of using the announce mic. Can you guys hear us okay without the announce mic? Okay. And a big round of applause for Sergeant Major Craig Lallander, head of the audio, for making all this happen. <laughs> Craig is the best in the business, the best in the business. He just recorded the latest Swamp Romp CD, uh, and the engineering sounds fabulous, fabulous. Wait till you hear it. Wait till you hear it. Avalon. <laughs> this is another uh, sweet... Uh, tender love ballad. <laughs> and we're going to go ahead and just stop on, bam, just on the, on the downbeat. Yeah, right. Okay. okay. Now, you're probably noticing that we're taking some liberties with the, uh, with the chords, doing some uh, side slipping, some tritone subs, some different sorts of substitutions. And we're just sort of playing off each other. To, um, and when that happens, when I hear Michael do it or when he hears me do it, we'll try and catch it. But uh, So this is just the, uh, the essential framework. All right? But always listen down to the bass because the bass gives away all the secrets. Tonic. And I asked Harry to provide tab because I don't read music, but <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just guessing, really. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't provide the tab. That's why. I love Michael because he has this this surfer aura to him. Awesome. <laughs> all right.
that's just the way we rehearsed it. <laughs> this next one is a Django original. Clouds. And I'm keeping in, in, in uh, context with Le Paris Cafe. Um, I got this at Le Starbucks. <laughs> For forty dollars? Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> that's not bad. I mean, that's not bad.
let's go. Uh, let's do a, a Baroque now. Let's go to Baroque. Dukes of Dixieland, um, and we played on Bourbon Street six nights a week, and Michael played in a traditional jazz ensemble uh, in high school, right, here in D.C. Right. Um, there's, a great, there's a great group that's run by a fantastic trumpeter and educator named Dave Robinson, <coughs> who's actually the older brother of, if anybody's familiar with the Maria Schneider Orchestra, um, the baritone player in that band uh, is Scott Robinson, and Dave is Scott's older brother. So it's very interesting to see that eclectic family, you know, uh, Maria Schneider versus like Louis Armstrong. <laughs> but any, Dave runs this great uh, band, and he educates us to the best of his ability. He does um, a great job. So, uh, uh, so yes, if, if you're local, make sure that you, you check that out. If you have kids that are interested in traditional <coughs> jazz, be sure you check out Capital Focus. And uh, a big shout out to my good friend Dave Sager, who is a, a recent gr Grammy recipient, and uh, he was a former landlord of mine down in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Fabulous trombonist. And uh, Dave, thank you for being here. This is like old home week again. Um, so Sweet Georgia Brown is something we play a lot uh, in, in different settings. And uh, with the Dukes of Dixieland, my, my main job as the trombonist was not playing the melody. It was splitting the difference between the upper tessitura and the tuba and just outlining the harmonies and using guide tones as much as possible. So it might be something like this with a, with a tempo, relatively up-tempo. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> all sorts of other stuff going on. But when I, uh, the Dukes of Dixieland, ba af after four years, we were, uh, the whole, the entire band was fired. And uh, Dave remembers all that. Uh, so the next day I called my friends at Disney World and I went down to Disney and uh, started playing in a band called the Yacht Club Jazz Quartet, where my role was drastically different, radically different. I wasn't doing that, I was playing just melodies. So we, I was forced to do this. So, um, I, w I had to learn melodies really, really quickly. And there were guys in the band who were decades older than me, oh, a lot. It was crazy. And they would force me to learn melodies as fast as possible to see they say, okay, we're going to do Sweet Georgia Brown uh, next set, so you have to go and practice it. So I would run under a palm tree at, in Disney World and just <laughs> practice and practice. I, I love Disney. It was fantastic. 
Uh, but being forced to play the melodies was something that I'm extremely grateful for. I wasn't grateful for it at the time, <laughs> but um, we're going to play a little bit of Sweet Georgia now for you. And what are we, what are we going to do in the end, Andrews? I don't know. Straight out, straight out, boom. Okay. All right. Dave knows whenever we do, whenever people sit in on Sweet Georgia Brown, the ending is always a huge mess. Here we go. One, two, Scott Shelsta, the amazing Scott Shelsta, founder of the Eastern Trombone Workshop. Thank you so much for being here, Scotty. A legend, ladies and gentlemen. And he hired me, so thank you for my life. tempo and then we're going to speed it up. Is that okay with you? Okay. All right. I'm going to drink another uh, sip of my very, very expensive water. So, um, I'm going to rest my chops and, and tell a joke. It's, a, it's transcribed from a French joke that I... <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's a, it was a French joke. But they, they have Boy Scouts in France. I was reading in Le Mans, was it? I think. And this, this dad was helping his, his son with the Pinewood Derby. And uh, he wanted to do something a little unusual. So he got a casket. 
that he uh, he put wheels on the casket, and the uh, son, of course, wanted to try it out. And the father said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I must check it out first. So he, he gets in the casket, and he makes sure that the, uh, the Pinewood Derby car, just for testing purposes, is safe, and it's going to go in the direction that he thinks it should go. And the son was disappointed, of course. But it got away from the dad. And he went down this hill, and he went faster and faster and faster, and went right into the parking lot of a strip mall. And then there was a CVS, and of course the automatic doors open up. This is a true story. They have CVS in France, too. So he goes, he goes right through the CVS and back to the pharmacy aisle. And he bumps into this pharmacist, and he sits up and he goes, Oh, do you have anything to stop my coffin? <laughs> what? What? This is, a, this, is a, this is a tough room, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> and we'll go pretty fast in the second half, too. Okay, I'm not even going to play the melody first time. Uh, um, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
we just never know what's going to happen. <laughs> Oh, yes, please, yes. History lesson. Yeah, um, so a, a lot of people don't realize um, Django was um, actually pretty much illiterate. Uh, and uh, at a certain time, he actually tried, he tried to come to America. And be, he was very successful in France. Um, he was like, he was a star uh, with Stefan Grappelli. A lot of people know that the hot club of France. Um, and in France, they were great. And so um, he tried to come to America. Uh, at a certain point, and um, and he ki he kind of failed. He didn't have the same amount of uh, success commercially, and part of that was due to his uh, illiteracy. Um, so he went back to France, um, pretty disheartened. Uh, and around that time, uh, the great Charlie Christian hit the scene uh, with Benny Goodman, uh, and Django started to try to fiddle around with the electric guitar, being influenced by uh, Charlie Christian, the great. Charlie Christian, um, and but uh, the also equally great uh, producer Norman Grants, um, a couple years later was putting together uh, that fantastic tour that he had with Bird. I can't remember the title. It was he had Bird and he had Lester Young and Coleman Hawkins. If anybody knows these these recordings, it was like. Um, what does anybody know what yeah. I'm talking? about? That's right, Jazz at the Philharmonic. Well, Django was actually slated to be a part of that tour, um, whenever that was, and and uh, he he died uh, just just before they went on tour. So he could have had uh, commercial success that way in America, but uh, unfortunately, there's you know there's if you if you ever want to see sort of the vibe of that whole. It was after this era was set, but the, go rent Paris Blues if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, you know that movie, don't you? It's a great movie. Sidney Poitier, Paul Newman, and um, the guitarist probably has some Django elements about his life in there. But uh, really check it out. It's, it's in black and white. Wonderful, wonderful movie. Diane Carroll's in it as well. Two jazz musicians and what happens in Paris. Um, we're going to continue on. You just want to do a couple of times on the, uh, on the setup? Yeah, sure. One, two, three, four.
quick ones. Uh, honeysuckle Rose, Fats Waller. I mean, Fats Waller was amazing. And uh, he was also a fantastic singer. And the bridge is particularly groovy. Uh, a lot of guide tones moving up. Uh, you'll hear that in the melody. But um, at the very, very end on the A3 section, this is A-A-B-A, -A -A, uh, a lot of guys will do some traditional side slipping harmonically upward. Ba -ba -da -ba -da, ba -ba -da -ba -da, then right back down again. And we'll do that on this time too. Okay, uh, straight out chord. One, two. been a great great audience a, a little different vibe than uh, than previous wacky swamp romp r uh, recitals but <laughs> but very very intimate I feel like we've we've taken a journey together so thanks so much for being here and uh, again wonderful seeing everyone uh, last time I did this was with uh, Pete Madsen and uh, and Pete stand up Pete uh, University of Nebraska Omaha w uh, led the group warm up nice hand for Pete yes indeed great great musician If you're looking for undergrads, grad schools, talk to Pete. He has money for you available, right? Right? <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed, for, for the fall. Um, we're going to do Cherokee. Uh, it's kind of fast. Um, <laughs> but I first learned, I learned the bridge to this after um, 
in, uh, where was it, uh, Laughlin, Nevada. I don't know if anyone have, any of you heard this story, but um, I was in Laughlin, Nevada. I had all my clothes in giant garbage bags in the back of my car because the feds had just raided the casino where I was working. And uh, so I, was, I ended up in this, this seedy, seedy dive casino uh, playing at the Colorado Bell in a rock and roll band and sleeping on the band room floor. So I walk out the next morning uh, to, to get an Egg McMuffin, and it was super, super hot. It was like 118 degrees. It was near Needles, California. And I go out to the car. I look in the back of the car, and the garbage bags have completely melted into all my clothes. And I'm thinking, the music business is pretty tough. You know, I could go drinking right now, but I think I'll just go to the band room, back to the band room, and practice the bridge to, to Cherokee for the next 45 minutes. And that's what I did. So I'm, I'm gla actually glad that happened. <laughs> Thank you, folks. You had a great audience. We'll, we'll uh, hopefully see you again next year. Enjoy your time at ATW. Sergeant Major Lauger. Okay. And if you're interested in more of this kind of stuff, go check out the Rosenberg Trio on Pandora. It's awesome. Very gypsy esque. Thank you. 
Yeah, it's his personal chair. Audio check, one, two.
Yeah. Cool. Thanks. I can hear you clear. Clear. I can hear great. Yeah. Mhm. Great. Thank you.
Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Sergeant First Class Chris Brannigan. I'd like to welcome you to uh, pretty much the halfway point of the 2015 American Trombone Workshop. Uh, for those of you uh, watching online, it's uh, soggy 34 degrees and snowing outside right now, so happy first day of spring to everybody. I'm really not happy about that. Um, we have a, a couple of housekeeping uh, issues to address. Um, the program information that you have in front of you uh, has changed slightly. Um, Israel Butler is going to be performing solo today, uh, and, and he'll announce some of the pieces. He's going to be doing a very cool tribute to George Roberts. And then um, from yesterday's guest artist recital, the premiere of the American Trombone Workshop Composition Contest winner, um, a new piece by Howard Buss, is going to take place today. So it'll be uh, fourth on your program. Um, and we're very pleased to have the principal trombonist of the National Symphony Orchestra, uh, Craig Mulcahy, joining us today for that premiere of that very cool piece. I heard some of the sound checks this afternoon. It sounds really neat. Um, I did mention early in the, or in the workshop that um, Sergeant Major Matt Neese's Arthur Pryor lecture slash recital was going to be moved slightly. That time that's printed in your program is correct. That will take place uh, in this space at 2.15 p.m. Um, I should also take this time to mention that uh, the concert tonight, the orchestra concert tonight, begins at 7.30 um, with the weather. And those of you who are driving on the post that may not have uh, Department of Defense IDs, it might take a little bit of extra time to get through the vehicle inspection station. So just make sure you leave yourself enough time um, if you leave post before that performance to get back in time to hear uh, a really fabulous orchestra concert that's going to take place tonight. So we are very pleased uh, to welcome our first group, the Blue Ridge Trombone Quartet, who are joining us today for the world premiere uh, of a new trombone quartet uh, by the American composer Anthony Barfield. Corey Mixdorf, Nathan Dishman, Drew Leslie on tenor trombones, and Sean McGee on bass trombone, please welcome the Blue Ridge Trombone Quartet. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. We are thrilled to be premiering this new piece by Anthony Barfield. If you haven't heard of him, he's a, a New York-based uh, composer. Um, he couldn't be here today. His Juilliard obligations are, are keeping him away. Hopefully he's, he's watching online. But he's a, a New York-based composer, um, a young guy. Uh, well, he's about our age. We're, we're young, right? He's, he's, yeah, he's a young guy. And um, he's really making him his, a name for himself as a composer. Um, but what w really drew us to him is that he's also a Juilliard-trained trombonist. So if you're going to have someone write you a trombone quartet, might as well get a trombone player to do that. Um, something about his music that we really wanted to integrate it into this piece is that everything he writes has a very strong rhythmic structure to it, um, rhythmic component, a drive, a groove, which this definitely has. Um, he has a very uh, big interest in um, the mythology of, of ancient Egypt and so how they would worship the ancient sun, sun god Ra. Aten is sort of, a, in a way, a manifestation of that. The actual sun disk, as they called it, was referred to as Aten. And um, the pharaohs uh, of then would, would you know, require everyone to praise that god. And um, Akhenaten was actually a pharaoh that uh, wrote, wrote hymns and whatnot. So in the middle of the rhythmic structure of this piece, there's um, a very sublime lyrical section that um, Anthony has written as sort of the hymn to Aten. So I hope you enjoy the premiere performance of Horizon of the Aten. Thank 
As we change, uh, change the set a little bit here for you this afternoon, uh, I'd also like to remind you um, that the exhibits are, are open now. They've opened today at noon, and they'll be open until 6 p.m. today. Uh, and they're going to reopen tomorrow at 9 a.m. and will be open uh, throughout the day until 6 p.m. tomorrow. Um, it's, uh, we, we really do encourage you to find some time, and the schedule's kind of full this afternoon and Saturday, but please do find some time uh, to just brave the elements and walk over to the community center and see some of the visit some of the uh, vendors that are joining us this afternoon. Our next artist has traveled quite a distance. Um, that's actually one of the great things about this workshop is that we've sort of grown. One of the reasons why we changed the name from the Eastern Trombone Workshop to the American Trombone Workshop is because over the years we've expanded much more. Uh, we've gone beyond being just a regional trombone workshop. So our next guest comes to us from Washington State. Uh, he's the professor of trombone at Central Washington University. Please welcome John Neurauer. In spite of the fact that I now live in Washington, which is just about as far away from here as you can get, uh, I grew up in West Virginia, and uh, in my undergraduate years, I came to the Eastern, what was then the Eastern Trombone Workshop, um, all of those years, and it's great to be back home. Um, and I use that as a segue because it's through my undergraduate trombone teacher, Keith Jackson, who is no stranger to this workshop, um, who helped me um, engage this project. He was my co-commissioner, uh, along with the West Virginia University School of Music, my alma mater, um, in commissioning this piece. I, I, I hope it becomes an important piece uh, in our repertoire. Shulamit Ran is an Israeli-American composer at the University of Chicago. Um, she's a Pulitzer Prize winner. She won in 1991 for her symphony. And uh, a piece that she perhaps is most well known for is her East Wind for a solo flute. And it was those two pieces that I became familiar with in my dissertation proceedings. Um, that I got very excited about. So this piece is, is kind of the, the, the conclusion, the capstone of that project that I started way back in 2005. Um, when I, that was, wow, that's a long time ago now. Um, where I started work towards a dissertation which was Pulitzer Prize winning composers and their contributions to solo trombone and chamber trombone literature. And that concluded with, uh, at that time at least, it concluded with um, uh, doing a, a performance analysis of, of several pieces and then recording pieces that had not previously been um, recorded before. And then I thought, through this, what I would like to do is eventually commission a composer who has not yet um, contributed to our repertoire. So I hope you enjoy this piece. Um, I think she has a really uh, exciting style, a really um, unique style. Uh, she, in this piece, it does a mixture of um, triadic type harmonies with uh, whole tone type <coughs> construction as well, which creates a nice little contrast as well as conflict. And then the final movement is a, just a beautiful, um, completely tonal uh, work centered around E flat minor. Um, so I hope you enjoy Shulamit Rand's Three Encounters for a Soul Trombone. Ha 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 ha. 
So from here on out, we're going to vary from uh, the printed program. Um, our uh, next artist, um, your program is accurate. We're, we're uh, next featuring Israel Butler, who is the professor of trombone at uh, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, which is a, a place not too far from here. Um, he is going to be performing a, a tribute to George Roberts. Unfortunately, John Marcellus, who we originally had on the program, uh, couldn't be with us this week. So uh, I'm going to let uh, Israel come out and tell you a little bit about what he's going to play today. So here's Israel Butler. Um, welcome. Thanks for coming out in this uh, lovely weather. <laughs> Spring is here, right? Um, I'm going to play a little tribute to George Roberts. Um, when I was in about 19 years old, I was in the, the Marine Corps in the band out in California, Camp Pendleton. And um, one of my teachers from high school was Joe Barati, and he said, you know, when you get out there, call George Roberts. So I did. And not knowing that this you know, legend was going to be so warm and friendly, he would come to base, and my first lesson was in my, uh, my barracks room. And the guys were like, you know, who's that old guy? I'm like, that's, that's Jaws, that's, you know, Superman, that's Mr. Bass Trombone. So he would come and uh, give me lessons at the, the band hall, and I would go and play with him in Coronado, where he played every, every, um, every Sunday afternoon. And uh, just taught me a lot about being a person, um, about the business, and uh, I'm going to play a little tribute to him. Bye. 
So, um, so George taught not not technical stuff in the lessons, but it was about you know moving your air, getting your armature together, but but singing a melody and singing on your instrument. And his his favorite phrase was, "The trombone is the closest instrument to the human voice," and I'm sure most of us will agree. You know, the the male singing voice, and um, that's what he portrayed. His whole career kind of came out of being a, a singing type player. He was sitting next to uh, Irby Green playing in the Gene Krupa Orchestra, and he's like, I can't play, you know, this guy's, you know, insane. It's Irby Green. I can't play that stuff. But what I can do is I can be Irby Green down an octave. So that's, that's where how he switched to bass trombone after hearing <laughs> playing next to Irby, and that's why we have, you know, George Roberts, Mr. Bass Trombone. Um, so, you know, other than playing scales, he would say, you know, after you're done playing work, because I was playing marches and, you know, concert music, he would say, after work, you know, you've done all your technical playing, play some ballads. So he was a real sweetheart, if those of you know him, and um, he always thought about singing the melody and, uh, you know, making people happy. So he had a huge following that came out to see him every Sunday to see him play these, you know, Frank Sinatra tunes. So I'm going to play another one. I'm going to play Skylark.
So I'm sure we all uh, know I've got you under my skin, big Frank Sinatra feature, and it's got, uh, it's got George's big solo in there before Milt Bernhardt's solo. Um, at, uh, George played this with, uh, at Penn State, and I, I played a trick on him, and right before his big solo, I walked down the, the aisle playing it for him, and uh, <laughs> he got a gas out of that. So here's I've got you under my skin.
I'm going to close with uh, Embraceable You, and um, it's another ballad, and it's a, a love song I'm de dedicating to, to George and his, his widow, Sue. Um, something that hopefully, hopefully we can all take with us from George was that his message of love, you know, that's what he taught. He didn't teach, you know, you're playing that too short, or you're playing it too long, or, you know, you know, you're playing out of tune. He would teach, you know, he would do this if I was playing out of tune, but the whole message was love and um, uh, really why I'm where I am today is because of George. Uh, he made a phone call to Tom Irvin and uh, got me into school there and then when it, when it was time for me to go to Eastman and study with Doc, he called up Doc and uh, you know, he said give this guy a chance and uh, luckily for me he did and uh, God bless George. Here's Embraceable You. So we're very lucky to have uh, our next performer joining us today. And I think this actually says a lot about um, the, the collegial spirit in the trombone community, um, specifically here in Washington, DC. Uh, Craig Mulcahy has been the principal trombonist of the National Symphony Orchestra uh, for five or s four or five years now, 
He's, his, his, he's had an interesting career at the Kennedy Center. He started out as the uh, principal trombonist of the Kennedy Center Opera House Orchestra, uh, performed there for four or five years, and then uh, won the job as second trombone uh, with the National Symphony. And then after the untimely passing of Milt Stevens, Craig was acting principal player, and then after a, a couple rounds of auditions became the permanent principal player, a position that he's been in for a few, uh, few years now. Um, as I mentioned this in terms of this collegial spirit, um, we mentioned to him that we have this composition contest. Uh, each year it goes from solo tenor trombone to bass trombone with piano accompaniment or trombone with uh, chamber ensemble accompaniment, etc. And we told him that the tenor trombone solo category this year, and he basically just volunteered uh, to perform the piece um, without having seen or heard any of the entries or knowing who the, the, what the winning composition was going to be, which was a, a, a tremendous benefit for us and pr for you today. So he uh, is going to be performing. Uh, this year's winning composition, which is by Howard Buss, uh, it's called Alien Loop de Loops, and the title refers to uh, technically the way the piece was constructed. It's for unaccompanied, I'm sorry, it's for trombone with electronic music accompaniment, uh, and the Loop de Loops part refers to the, the process by which the, the, uh, the accompanying music was, uh, was created. Um, the notes by the composer uh, indicate that it can be performed by uh, tenor or bass trombone uh, with a couple of easy octave transpositions. Uh, it's a very neat piece. I heard them, uh, we, we did a little sound check before the recital this afternoon. And it was really cool to hear, uh, to hear this music. Um, Howard Buss actually wanted to be here with us today, um, but due to some, some health uh, problems that he's experiencing right now, he couldn't uh, make the trip to D.C., so we wish him, uh, wish him uh, good health, and I know he's watching us online today, so I'd like to acknowledge him. Uh, this afternoon. So if you will please join me in welcoming uh, Principal Trombone of the National Symphony uh, and a friend to the American Trombone Workshop, Craig Mulcahy. Thank <laughs> you. 
forget to mention one thing. The composer, uh, Mr. Buss, wanted me to mention that the piece has actually has been published and there are parts available over at the exhibit. So check it out. Uh, see you all back in here at 2.15 for Matt Neese's master class recital on Arthur Pryor.
He's asking me to sit down so you can hear me on the microphone. Um, I just want to make a quick announcement. Uh, the U.S. Army Brass Quintet, who's joining, uh, who uh, Sergeant Major Nice is going to be performing with this afternoon, uh, Master Sergeant Terry Bingham, the trumpet player, is also the principal trumpet of the concert band, and they're still in rehearsal uh, across the hall right now. So um, we're probably going to start uh, about five minutes late. Um, those of you that are watching online, just uh, sit tight, and I'll make another announcement when we're ready to go. Thanks.
myself comfortable here. Uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, it's a it's a great pleasure, you know, as as part of the the organizing team of the American Trombone Workshop. We, you know, we we try to bring in uh, great trombonists from all across the country in different parts of the world to play for you. But it's always a, a real pleasure for us when we have an opportunity to feature some of the fantastic trombonists and musicians that are uh, that are here as part of U.S. Army Band Pershing Zone. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Sergeant Major Matt Neese and the U.S. Army Brass Quintet. Thank <laughs> you. 
So thank you very much. And of course, uh, what you just heard was the United States Army uh, Band Brass Quintet, of which I am a proud member of. And uh, I'd like to thank these guys in public for, for putting up with all this trombone music this week and rehearsing. Yeah, yeah it's been a while. They, they've really been just, uh, just fantastic. And a special thanks to Sergeant First Class, uh, John Both, who was quite ill yesterday, our, our tubist. And uh, without, if somebody couldn't be here today, we couldn't do, do the show. So he's, he's very dedicated. And so, John, thanks for being here. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we just played uh, uh, Glinka's uh, Ruslan and uh, Ludmilla, which has nothing to do with what we're about to present to you. Uh, we just like to play that, so we did it. So I'm going to talk to you about um, um, an American trombone icon, uh, Mr. Arthur Pryor. And he lived from 1870 to 1942. And I'm going to read, read something that was written about him. His execution set the prairies afire. His vibrating pedal tones rattled the windows of the theater and killed the goldfish, stunned the canaries all the way out to the packing plant where even the iron gates trembled. So said a newspaper reporter in Omaha. Uh, a reporter in Kansas City reported that a riot was almost caused when cries for prior, prior, prior were mistaken for fire, fire, fire. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is how it went for years uh, when, when the superstar, the superstar performed uh, all, all over the world. He was referred to as the Paganini of trombone, and it's estimated that he performed o over 10,000 times um, all over the world, as I mentioned. And it's, it really is it's a great story, uh, a great American story of a man who, who built his career on his love of the trombone, the music, and his understanding of the music industry. In common terms, he was a pop star. And you know, there's a lot we could talk about, but we'd be here for hours if I went into all the tangents of, you know, um, how many college students we have? <laughs> oh, raise your hand if you ever, ever, ever did a research paper. So you know what I'm talking about. You start looking at something, you really have to keep it focused. So I'm going to you know, breeze through a lot of things. Um, so I'm going to skip about 20, 30 years. But he was discovered by, by John Philip Sousa. I love this picture of Sousa, by the way. And, and he, was a, he was a featured soloist with, with the Sousa band and ended up uh, being second in command. Here's, here's the letter that Sousa wrote, this is, this is funny. Um, it says, uh, uh, my dear sir, your name is given to me as a competent performer on trombone. Will you kindly inform me whether you'd be willing to en engage in my new Marine band? And if so, at what salary? So you got, you got to pick a salary. So it's a nice, nice piece of history right there. Um, so uh, one of his earliest compositions, one of his early solo compositions uh, was Thoughts of Love. And who's played that? Okay, so this pretty much launched his career in Sousa's band, and he, he composed it for himself. He composed all the solos for himself uh, because there were no solos that were written for him because no, nobody was soloing like that, that we know of. He believed that so, uh, soloists should compose their own solos to showcase their own talents. Uh, you know, after all, who would know better someone's strengths and weaknesses than themselves? So what's interesting about Arthur Pryor is He's a composer of a distinct body of solo literature, specifically for the trombone, that's retained its popularity throughout the years. It's still published, it's available today, it's performed all over the place, 100 years later, which is, which is pretty astounding. So here's, here's our first solo composition, and a lot of you recognize this, <laughs> right? And here's, uh, here's Thoughts of Love. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, Arthur Pryor changed the way, in his day, uh, the way musicians, composers, and, and the public felt about the trombone. And to show this, we can look at some reviews written about the, uh, a performance of the very solo I, I just played, Thoughts of Love. Here's the Birmingham Post. A trombone solo, Thoughts of Love, contributed by, by Mr. Arthur Pryor, was an achievement quite unique. The player realized a tone quality which no other soloist on that instrument has ever produced. And yet, in a way of rapid scale passages, his performance was especially astonishing. So pretty strong words. And here's an, another paper. His execution savors of the marvelous. It was almost too much to believe that such a pure and exquisitely beautiful tone could be produced on an instrument whose usual characteristics are aggressive. <laughs> his, his solos are not profound in the sense of musical substance, um, but they're very serious in their approach to the trombone the very lyrical and the technical capabilities, of course. Um, and and the, there really are no novelty prior trombone solos full of smears uh, like, like uh, Lassus trombone, things like that. Um, he treated the instrument with great respect. 
And Thoughts of Love was performed by Pryor with the Sousa Band uh, in, in 1893, 11 years before it was published. Um, and the theory here is that he didn't rush to produce, uh, to uh, publish his solos because he didn't think that anybody could play them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is probably true at the time. Um, he, had, he had the great, a unique ability to combine elements of the classical world, you know, technique with elements of popular music, simple melody. And the result is music that virtually anybody could enjoy. So, um, and then he would incorporate other elements in the solos like you just heard, um, ornamentations, the bending of the times, um, wild cadenzas and variations and, and such. His, um, the form of his, of his solos is kind of interesting. They're, they're usually always A, B, C, a D, A, and it's very similar to the March form, which was made popular by um, Sousa and, and him and Scott Joplin and, and alike uh, during that time period. The main difference being that in prior solo, he liked to bring back the main theme in the end for some, some wild variations. Harmonically, this solo is, just starts in B flat, goes to E flat, goes to A flat, and then back to B flat. Um, like most of his works, are, it's mostly diatonic. It's, it's really about the playing, which, which makes, it, um, makes it special. So in addition, we're gonna jump around a little bit with his, with his, uh, his compositions. And in addition, obviously, to being a solo composer, he wrote marches and rags and things like that. So we're gonna move on to another tune now. Um, this is, I guess, a march, we'll call it. Change the slide. And this is a, a tune called The Whistling Dog. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Sergeant First Class Delomo is going to join us on drums on this one. We all knew the answer to that question. <laughs> this will require audience participation, which I'll, I'll explain. So, this is probably his most uh, known tune, uh, tune of his day. It was used um, in a theme song for movies, radio shows, commercials, um, for bands. In fact, uh, one of his sons, Ray Pryor, who is an actor, who is in, in over 70 films, uh, if you Google his name, you'll, you'll recognize him as a character actor. Um, he was also a trombone player, and he had a big band, and this was his theme song. Uh, so it's a fun nature tune, um, and, and the title, as you can see, the picture, it, it captures the innocence of a boy looking for his dog, and at the end, he whistles for his dog, and the, and the dog barks and appears. Uh, that's what we're going to do. And the whistling and barking is done by the band and the audience. And the marketing for this picture, um, you know, it's, it's, it's all the charm of a Norman Walk, uh, Rockwell painting, I think. Let me change the slide. So when he had um, a tune that, that did well, uh, he, would, he would write about them in magazines so they would be uh, performed properly by, by the bands that would buy them. So here's one of the articles in the metronome. And I'll go to the next slide. And then on the right, top right there is the actual article about the Whistler's dog. So here's some notes about, about this tune. Um, first thing it says, for dance, even tempo. And this comment referring to dance tells us that people dance to this. So it uh, it, this was music for dance function, which meant it was the center of social functions, which is pretty big in, in the music business. So people were dancing to this and, and, and listening to it. And then it says, for concert, retard in measures three and four, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, Measure 16, moderato. It, it goes on and, and explains how to do it. Let me, I'll jump down to the interesting part. And, and the DC for the pause is pause for 50 seconds in Dakota. Don't follow the whistle. That's somebody's phone. Don't follow the whistle as written. Expect the audience to whistle and bark with the band. <laughs> so the, the melody is usually whistled, but I, I'll play it for you the first time, and then we're all going to whistle it uh, when we play it again. And fortunately, we have, we have a master whistler in the band, Master Sergeant Bingham. Right here, he's a, in addition to playing trumpet, he's a great whistler. He's gonna, he'll be our, our lead whistler. And on the sheet music, here's, here's a tuba part. And if you can see on the bottom there, it says, uh, bark through your instrument like a large dog. <laughs> so I guess the tuba was kind of like an like a amplification. They would, they would bark in there. So um, let me read uh, for you. The, um, the, ad the advertisement from, from, from Carl Fisher about this tune as they would market uh, band leaders. Pardon our enthusiasm about Pryor's a whistler and his dog. There are plenty of, of reasons for our joy. If ever there was a novelty composition inclined to be a popular craze, this is it. Band leaders can't imagine not having it. It leaves the audience applauding, wanting more. The whole audience will whistle, whistle it with you. The melody is so catchy, you can't lose it. 
Everybody likes it. Everybody wants it. Try it and make it the hit of your life. <laughs> so apparently it was quite popular and requested by band leaders everywhere. However, um, Pri Pryor grew tired of it and actually composed a companion piece titled Sammy and His Missouri Mule. <laughs> he said in a 1941 interview that he did not keep a copy of The Whistler at home, but that he still liked it, uh, but he was embarrassed by it a little bit. So that comment tells me that perhaps because he was such a serious player, maybe he wanted to be known for his solo compositions and his more serious works and his playing rather than this novelty tune that he wrote. But it is, it is a, it's, a, it's a beautiful tune, as, as you'll see, and he had a gift for melody. He also said he wrote it as a memorial to his boyhood pet bulldog named Roxy. He was a dog lover and always had dogs uh, throughout his life. So the tune was very personal to him. Um, but, and this tune did sweep the nation. It did more to spread the, the name of Pryor than anything else. Uh, and it was mentioned in his, his obituary, and his obituary went worldwide. Not many people's obituaries go worldwide, and his did. His did. So today, this is kind of cool, uh, we have from the Army Band right here. This is one of the early publications that we had in the library. It has a number, th number 300 on it, 382. We have probably over 3,000 marches in the library, and the back is stamped the Army Band, the Army War College. This is when the band wasn't even here. We were across the river, I believe. Um, and any, any historians here? Anyway, that's another tangent that I mentioned. We're just going to leave that. But this is probably, this is one of the original that Carl Fisher is Carl Fisher. This is one of the pieces of music that was, that was uh, marketed and purchased by the Army Band back in the day, probably the same time that was written. So we're going to move on and we're going to play, we have to rehearse the ending first because you guys are going to participate. So here's, here's what's going to happen. We're going to play the very ending for you. It's going to sound like this. Bug it up, bug it up, bug it up, bug it up, bug it up. And then we're going to whistle. And then we're going to do a drum roll. And we're all going to bark like dogs. <laughs> and then we're going to end it. Okay? And I guess there's a, there's a story, too, that at one concert, the whistling went on for a very long time outside, and, and the dog actually appeared. <laughs> So whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it makes a great story, right? <laughs> so let's 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 rehearse. We'll, we'll play. Uh, yeah. Okay, and then we'll whistle. Here we go. One, two, three. Now we all whistle for the dog. <laughs> the drum roll. We bark like dogs. <laughs> So like I said, I'll, I'll play the melody the very first time, but then you're gonna have to whistle it. You get to hear it. It's a catchy melody. I think I think you'll hear it. So gentlemen, you ready? It's the whistler and his dog. Here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
That was some fantastic audience participation. Thank you so much. Moving, moving back to his uh, solo compositions, um, this is one of his, his, his better known ones. Who's played the, the Fantastic Polka? Okay, so I apologize now for about the way I'm about to play it. Um, this is one of his, probably his, his uh, last compositions perhaps, at least, at least for solo it is. It was written in 1939. Um, and like his other solos, it's very, very diatonic. However, it's, it's very different in, in the way the melody moves around, and it is a polka style, of course. Harmonically, it's the same thing. We start in B flat, go to F, go to E flat, and then back to B flat. And then we have a, a wild a dog, dog fight uh, type ending. And of his 15 solos, this, this is a culmination of all, of all that solo work he, that he did. And of course, he wrote this for himself. So it's interesting because when he played his other solos, and compare it to bluebells and things like that. This is a, a very refined solo in terms of composition for, for, for the horn. So this is Fantastic Polka, and let's do it. Expect me a softball game. Thank <laughs> you. 
Over. <clears throat> so, um, Arthur Pryor was about three years younger than, than uh, Scott Joplin, and he certainly would have come in contact with him in his travels in the music circuit. And he was also raised in St. Saint, Saint Joseph, Missouri, a frontier town not far from where uh, Scott Joplin uh, lived for some time. So, when, when Pryor was in Sousa's band, Incidentally, this is a, I forgot to put this picture up while I was playing the last tune. That's just a scene from a, from a concert. Isn't that amazing? You know, it's, just, it's a wonderful picture. Um, so the, when he was in Sousa's band, uh, Pryor was known for his, uh, his ability to, to play and write and his liking of ragtime. So it was his job in the Sousa's band to teach the members of the band how to play ragtime. And when the recording industry came out, let me skip, skip a slide here. When, when the recording industry was born, um, Sousa didn't like it. He, he didn't like the technology because he thought he knew it would replace live music, and of course he was right. Uh, Pryor, on the other hand, um, saw it as an opportunity. He was a visionary. He embraced it. And as Sousa's assistant conductor, he, he, con he actually directed and conducted a lot of those uh, Victor record recordings of the Sousa band. And eventually, Pryor would be employed by Victor Records as a producer and a conductor. If you ever go to a concert over at the Marine Band Barracks here, you can see one of the, those original wax discs. It's in the, the display in the lobby there. It's pretty cool piece of history. It looks like a, like a peanut butter jar. <laughs> it's a wax disc, but it's, it's kind of neat. So eventually Pryor would leave Sousa's band, start his own band, of course, uh, but they kept a working professional relationship. And while the Sousa band continued to travel and perform all over the world and, th and did some recordings, um, the prior band would spend most of its time in the studio and would end up having a greater influence worldwide uh, than Sousa. So for 25 years, Pryor was on staff at Victor uh, with hundreds of singles. It's amazing. And his ragtime recordings uh, were the most popular and introduced ragtime to many people and really bridged the gap uh, between March music, ragtime, and of course uh, led the way for, for, for jazz. Dixieland uh, came out of that. Um, so many of his rags uh, are recorded I'm sorry, he recorded more rags than any, any other band leader. Uh, it's amazing. So he took ragtime and, and put march music together and made what we, we refer to as a ragtime march. And this next tune we're going to play is Razazza Mazazza. And it was marketed as, as the king of rags. And what, like I mentioned earlier about um, the business of music, every, every band in America, I'm sorry, every town in America had a band or bands. And here's a little, a little personal history here. This is, a, this, is the, this is the Fullerton Band. This is a, a suburb of Allentown. And on the upper right, on the far right, the guy holding the euphonium, that's my great uncle Al. And he, he played in, in the Fullerton Band. And, uh, and my, the story I was told is that he, he survived World War I, came home, and unfortunately was, was, was mugged and murdered. In the, yeah, so sorry, Al. But anyway, that's, that's my great uncle Al, and he played uh, euphonium. And I found that out after I was playing euphonium in middle school. My mom came out, she went, hey, this is my, or my dad came out, this is my great uncle, my uncle Al, he played euphonium too. Like, that's kind of weird. But a little family history there. So um, let's, let's play, uh, let's play Razazza Mazazza. Thank you. 
Performance in uh, Leipzig, Leipzig, Germany, before an audience of an estimated 25,000 people, Pryor received a, a tremendous ovation. And during the intermission, uh, members of the Gewandhaus Symphony Orchestra came backstage to disassemble his trombone and inspect it, <laughs> questioning how anyone could achieve te technique on the trombone such as Pryor without the benefit of some mechanical aid. They thought it was Yankee trickery, tomfoolery, hijinks. The only thing they noticed uh, that was unusual was that Pryor's horn had a very small bore. In fact, a point four five eight. So there's trumpets that are bigger than that, bore-wise, and a small bell. So very interesting. This trombone is uh, that I just played, of course, you know, is, a, is much larger than that. Um, it's, large, it's, it's a big bore, referred to by trombone players. Um, and the other horn over there, which I'll play in a minute, that's a, a small bore horn. That's, that's a .458 bore, which is still bigger than what Pryor played. And according to Steve Dillon, is Mr. Mr. Dillon here? Mr. Dillon's not here. S Steve Dillon, by the way, is an expert on, on uh, Arthur Pryor, and he actually owns Arthur Pryor's trombone. And I, I spoke to him about it, and it is a .458 bore. And it's for sale for $250,000. So <laughs> trombone players can afford that, right? So, <laughs> so it was a custom trombone horn uh, built for Mr. Pryor in Elkhart. Uh, and that's where, that, that's where that, that trombone on the end there was built, too. Um, and much smaller than anything available, of course. So this is kind of important when you try to understand um, Arthur Pryor and, and the way he played and what, and what things, what people talked about him, you know. Uh, you have to understand in his day, there weren't big sound, you know, big sound systems everywhere he went, clip-on mics, uh, and, and playing f outside for 20,000 people. You know, you don't have these, these stadium sound systems. So, you know, what, what kind of trombone, what kind of horn is going to cut across the field? You know, a, a small bore, you know. So there's your, there's your, your, your Yankee uh, trickery. You know, it's just American engineering, American know-how. So he had the right equipment to get the job done. And, you know, since the end of his time, um, trombones have been getting bigger and bigger, in, especially in the classical world. Um, and in the commercial world, they pretty much have, have remained, sm remained small, small bore. Um, and this is where the divide in the trombone world really started. And, and to this day, you, you still get comments, you know, that refer to the small horn as, as a pea shooter. Oh, it's a pea shooter. You know, when, it's, you know, so easy, you can show me how easy it is, you know. So... <laughs> You know, you get comments like that, from, and it's, it's kind of strange. I, I don't understand that mentality, but, you know, what's cool about the trombone is we have so many different sounds, colors. Um, if you were here last night, you heard all these different soloists with all these different sounds. You know, Sly Hampton plays a huge trombone. You know, he sounds wonderful. Um, and and other, other people play small trombones, and it sounds great. So, you know, that's just the way, that's what he did, and, you know, Arthur Pryor influenced a whole generation of, of trombone players, and probably the next person he handed the gauntlet to was Tommy Dorsey, right? And of course, he was famous for getting sentimental over you. He played this beautiful lyrical solo on, on that, just like Arthur Pryor would. So he was very inf influential. He influenced, influences us to this day. Um, and just an amazing um, history with this man and his, his, his legacy, which, which lives today. So this last solo I'm going to do, if I don't pass out, is... <laughs> is the tour de force of his solos. Um, it's the Bluebells of Scotland. And who's, who's played that? Okay. So this is the solo that is on a lot of uh, auditions, 
and it scares a lot of people away because it, it is ridiculous. Um, <laughs> and it's funny because I was getting my music together and I was looking. I was like, "Where's?" I'm looking for the bluebells. I'm like, "Where's bluebells?" It's like, I've had it, I've had it memorized for years. So I, I had no music for that. Um, but this is the solo that um, won me the job in the brass quintet. So it's a special solo for me. I it was on the on the audition list. Those guys, these these jerks, put on the list, <laughs> and uh, so. So it's, 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 you know, this is the solo that uh, a lot of trombone players work on when, when they're young and, and you still keep work. I, I still work on it um, as much as I can. So this is going to conclude the concert today. I'd like to thank the Army Brass Quintet, uh, Master Sergeant Terry Bingham, right behind me. <laughs> Master Sergeant Christian Hinkle, also on trumpet. Sergeant First Class John Voth on tuba. Thank you for coming in today, John. <laughs> Master Sergeant Rick Lee on French horn. <laughs> and uh, Sergeant First Class uh, Tom DeLomo, who played drums earlier. <laughs> so thank you very much, and I'm going to close with Blue Bells of Scotland.
trombone choir. It's wonderful seeing you all here this afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. It's a pleasure to be here for the first time at the American Trombone Workshop. That first piece we perform is a piece by one of our good friends and local Texas composer, Jack Wilds. And Jack was one of my classmates at the University of Texas at Austin. He's a band director at Hayes High School in Buda, which is just right outside of Austin. And just a fantastic piece. Uh, when we premiered this piece two years ago at the 2013 International Tremont Festival, we had no idea that the piece would become so popular. Um, it's been performed by various Tremont choirs throughout the country. Um, at last year's um, ITF in Eastman, at last year's Slider Asia Festival in Hong Kong. And if it's a piece that you're interested in, it's, it's available through uh, Cagoras Publications. So a very, very exciting piece. And Jack has a lot of other great stuff out there, too, for the wind band repertoire. So each semester at Texas State, we like to get back to our rich trombone choir history roots. And we, our trombone choir history roots date back in, for the 700 years. And we like to do some things that are kind of historical. So this next piece is uh, an example of that. And this is Thomas Stolter's Fantasia. Thank 
So now we turn to the music by a, a famous composer in the trombone community. Derek Bourgeois has contributed uh, many great works, concerti, uh, chamber music for our instruments as well as uh, low brass. And Scared to Fenebre was one of those pieces that I enjoyed playing in college and grad school, and I wanted to conduct it very badly. And um, this is a piece that just definitely stretched us as an ensemble and gives our, give our students to do a more challenging rep and probably condense the group down a little bit. And so we hope you enjoy Scherzo Finebre by Derek Bourgeois.
So I met our first guest artist about 10 and a half years ago when he just switched to bass trombone. And it's just been amazing seeing his career just take off these last few years. It's kind of started in Washington, D.C. with the United States Navy Band and currently his second season as bass trombonist of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. And um, we had a lot of fun when we were um, classmates at UT Austin playing in trombone choir, trips like this. And when we found out where both of us were going to be here, we thought, you know, we should definitely try to collaborate some way. And so um, please help me bring to the stage performing Stephen Verhel's Capriccio for bass trombone and trombone sextet, Brian Hecht.
So next, we turn to the music of Anthony Barfield. He's, he's definitely not a stranger in the trombone community, um, a fantastic trombonist, and has definitely um, done some amazing work um, for not just trombone repertoire, but just you know, band repertoire as well. And this piece was kind of conceived by Brad Palmer, the trombone professor at Columbus State University. He hosts a fantastic uh, week-long summer festival called the Southeast Trombone Symposium. And Brad commissioned Anthony to write this piece for uh, the S Southeast Trombone Symposium's Professor's Choir to perform last summer, and it was recorded. And along with that, there was a consortium of various trombone choirs throughout the country, and we were fortunate to be a part of that. And it was kind of giving each group the first rights to perform the piece for, for this year. And the piece is very exciting, just like Anthony's music. It starts off with these nice, lush, haunting melodies, and then it goes into this nice, awesome groove towards the, towards the middle half of it. So we hope you enjoy Anthony Barfield's Dreamcatcher.
So this next piece on the program is probably the only work that was not originally written for trombone, but uh, after you hear it, you, you would think it's definitely appropriate for it. Um, we, we, use, we like to take a lot of transcriptions, um, even though there's a lot of great original works written for our instrument. Um, this next work was written by a Russian composer, Dmitry Shostakovich, and arranged by um, a Dallas-based uh, trombonist and composer, uh, John Bowles, who's contributed a lot to our trombone community and director of the International Trombone Festival. And he has a lot of great uh, music that's available for trombone choirs. So I highly suggest checking some of that stuff out. And with this prelude, it kind of shows off um, the nice subtleties of the trombone choir where we can play nice and soft, but then also there's opportunities where the trombone, trombone can sound loud and it just has this really nice majestic organ-esque sound. So we hope you enjoy John Bowles' arrangement of Shostakovich's prelude, number 19, opus 34. Since we were up here in Washington, D.C., we thought it would be very appropriate to do a piece by um, one of the Pershing, Pershing's own um, composers and arrangers. And James Kasich is another one um, who's a former trombonist and has contributed a lot to our repertoire. And Hex Files is one of those p pieces, um, it's like a three minute roller coaster. It kind of starts off with a lot of chaos and there's like nice grooves in the middle of it. He um, uses Harmon mutes and bucket mutes to create these interesting colors. So we hope you enjoy Kazakh's Hex Files. Thank you. 
All right, next on the program, we're going to do a piece from a Texas composer, David Wilborn. He's on the faculty at Texas A&M and College Station, and I'm just a big fan of his music. His music is very accessible, not just for trombone players, but just non-musicians in general. Uh, this piece was, it won a composition competition, I believe, in 2005, and he originally wrote this work for his, his low brass students at Texas A&M, and then kind of created it into a six uh, part work. And we're going to do the third movement out of this piece. It's Carnival, has a lot of uh, nice driving ry uh, rhythms, and we hope you enjoy David Wilborn's Carnival from Excursions. Thank you. 
So we have one more to play for you. Um, thank you so much for coming out this afternoon. Uh, it means a lot to these students. Uh, we're actually on spring break right now, and so to see so many familiar faces in the crowd, it looks, it's just awesome. I'd like to also thank uh, Sam Woodhead and Chris Brannigan for putting on such a fantastic event. This is really great where trombone players can kind of get together and talk shop and do things that we can't really do um, at other conferences. Um, our next guest artist, uh, joined our faculty at Texas State this past fall, and he's definitely not a stranger to the stage. He was a winner of the National Jazz Trombone Solo Competition a few years back and played with the Army Blues. And I'd also like to thank um, Victor Barranco, the jazz chair, for securing a rhythm section for us as well. And so without further ado, playing Ian McDougall's Whenever I'm Alone With You, Paul Deemer.
Sergeant First Class Sam Woodhead, Chairman of the American Trombone Workshop. Uh, very excited about this next event. Um, Brian is a, a very talented young musician. Uh, very fortunate that he was here in town uh, playing with the Navy Band just a couple of short years ago, and I got to know him then. And it was very obvious to me that you know this young gentleman was off to great things. And as if you've been following his career at all, you know that he's uh, the bass trombonist right now in the Atlanta Symphony. Um, he's also uh, been subbing with some of the best orchestras in, in the country, New York, Chicago, um, Seattle, just to name a few. Uh, I, I tried to read his bio, but it was so long, I just kind of was like, well, it's basically everybody, you know. <laughs> um, very talented. And, you know, one of the great things about workshops like this is how collaborative they are. You know, once somebody learns that they're coming to the workshop, and then the word gets around, it's like, oh, Brian's coming. Well, let's get him to do this. And then somebody else hears Brian's going, oh, let's get him to do that. So he was playing on Angel Sabero's recital yesterday. Uh, he was playing just uh, uh, you know, a short time ago with the Texas uh, State University. Um, and he's going to be giving this master class. He's also going to be performing with the concert band tomorrow night. So uh, plenty of opportunities to hear Brian. Um, I'm really looking forward to his master class and hearing what he has to share uh, because, you know, again, I could obviously tell he was such a talented young musician, but now that I've heard him come back after a couple of years in the symphony, I mean, it's, it's really astounding how much he's grown in such a short time. So uh, very uh, excited to welcome to the stage Brian Hecht.
basically start off we're gonna have, we've got a few guys playing today and I uh, just wanted to start off by sort of just talking about um, a few techniques that I sort of hold near and dear to my practicing that um, I, I, I re really use with a lot of my students and I feel <coughs> that they're integral and uh, 
to how I am as a player and how I play and perform. And um, so basically, starting from the very first thing of the day, right? You know, I'm sure your teachers have always told you, you know, start out with some buzzing, start out with some long tone. How many people actually do this? You can be honest. Really? That's good. <laughs> Keep doing it. <laughs> um, You'd be surprised how, how many students I have or how many students I, I uh, will, will come take a lesson and I say, you know, have you, have you been doing your buzzing? And of course they'll say, you know, oh, absolutely, every day, yes, yes, sir. But, well, then, then why doesn't it show? You know, and so you've got to do these things, but you have to do them um, with uh, the right results in mind. And you also need to do them a lot, like more than you probably would think, right? Um, whenever I was at uh, UT Austin in my undergrad, I was pretty awful. I was, uh, I was on tenor trombone, and <laughs> I was convinced that I was going to be the next Joe Alessi. And I was just like, that's me. I'm short. I'm Jewish. I got it. Let's do this, right? <laughs> I play tenor. I can do All right. Um, and it really wasn't <laughs> happening. I was listening to his CDs, and I was trying to play along with them. And I'm like, man, you know, he gets to a point around like E above the staff that he just keeps going, and I stop. You know, that's not a good sign for a tenor trombone player. So, um, Dr. Briggins had me switch over to bass trombone, and I was very reluctant to do so. Um, and but once I finally did, it was sort of eye-opening, like what I couldn't do on a bigger mouthpiece. Um, I was playing on like a 5G before a Bach 5G, and then he switched me over to uh, a equivalent of a dump dumpster. You know, like it was like a trash can on a trombone, and I had no idea what to do. I could barely make a sound, and so I really had to go back to the basics. And uh, I, you know, I did something that you know. Every student is supposed to do, but rarely does. I played long tones for like an hour or two hours a day, every single day, until I got better. And for like the first two months, it was miserable because I wasn't getting any better. Um, it, but then I started noticing a little bit of change. I started noticing my sound opening up a little bit more, my intonation getting a little bit better, my attacks, my response. Every, like, everything was sort of just getting better. And I realized that I was so determined to not be wrong about being a professional trombone player that that's sort of what drove me to do all this practicing. And it, it, I mean, yes, the motivation needs to be there, but I'm a strong believer that the process getting there doesn't need to, need to suck. <laughs> so um, one thing that I start doing now is I, I still do long tones every single day. I still do buzzing every single day, but I do it differently and I do it with a little bit of help. Um, Basically, what I what I'll do is um, I'll I'll put on like uh, how, many, how many of you guys know the band Muse? Maybe some of you guys. How about Mumford and Sons? Does that cover a little bit more? Okay, maybe half of you guys know those two bands. But I like I like those two bands a lot. Um, and so what I'll do is for I, when I first get my horn out, um, I know I need to buzz for 20 minutes to sound good. So instead of sitting there and <laughs> you know that's really boring to me, so I just put a song on and I'll play drones beneath it. Um, uh, for the next song, I'll follow the melody. Uh, for the next song, I'll try and har harmonize. But the basic idea is that I, just ba I was just hanging out listening to music, and I got 20 minutes of buzzing in. So buzz along to the radio, buzz along, make, make it fun so that you actually do it, because if you don't do it, you're not going to get the benefits of it. Um, <coughs> whenever I go to the horn and I actually start, uh, start playing, I've, you know, I've written out, I've got a little notepad where I actually have like the keys of songs just so I can remember them and eventually I don't need it anymore so like I'll put on uh, Muse Hysteria or something like that and I think it's in well I don't remember so apparently I do need it um, I think it's in like we'll say B flat right so I'll just start out with a B flat and I'll try and follow it most of the time it's a one four five one um, har uh, harmonic progression so these pop songs are very uh, very predictable right and it's a good way to train your ear around the pitch as well. So I'm playing long tones, moving along with the harmonic progression of the song. And at the same time, I've got a drone, because these songs are auto-tuned, right? It's a big secret. No, they definitely are. <laughs> you know, they're all auto-tuned. So you've got this drone that you can play along with that isn't as boring or like, you know, skull-numbing as a drone going off in your ear. So um, I do, I usually buzz about two songs and then I'll hit the horn for a couple songs and if it doesn't feel right, if it doesn't feel fresh, like I don't feel like like it's my best day again, 
you know, um, then I'll put the horn back down and I'll go back to buzzing. And I do something that I want to share with you guys. Um, it's helped me a lot. If it helps you, cool. If not, you know, you know, leave it here. But um, it's something I do called hand buzzing. It's really helped me out a lot. Basically, um, whenever I buzz without without the hand or without any sort of resistance on the mouthpiece, I, uh, initially I found it very difficult to to get a good sound and to actually get a buzz. Like. Um, I feel like free buzzing and buzzing without resistance are some of the harder forms of buzzing. So um, I've, I've added just a little bit of, re of resistance and sort of a resonance chamber and I take it right here with my hand and then I just cut my other hand around it and it sounds like this. And I find that adding just a little bit of resistance when first getting into buzzing and first like doing those necessary uh, rudiments, it, it helped a lot to actually produce a buzz and be something I was happy with instead of <laughs> and then just being like, well, that sucked. Let's put this away. Um, so I'll, I'll hand buzz these songs. That's something I meant to mention. But I will, I'll hand buzz these songs and I'll do two of them. Get on the horn. If it doesn't feel great, I'll do a third song. And usually, honestly, I don't even stick to that. I, I sort of like, I get carried away sometimes and I'll do like five songs and I'll, you know, well, I warmed up this morning buzzing for like 30 minutes. And I was like, I should probably stop so I don't just kill my face. But, you know, 30 minutes of buzzing out of the way, and I actually enjoyed it. Um, same thing with the long tones. You know, um, whenever I, before I, before I figured out how to actually have fun with this, I was, uh, I was on the horn when I first switched to bass from and I just sat at a piano, and I would hit middle C, play middle C. And I would hold it as long as I could, biggest breath in, and just as long as I could with a nice natural taper. Be natural. Be natural as long, I mean, like, seriously, people, how, how boring is that? I mean, I, I was bored to tears when doing it, but it, it helped, so I, I decided to keep it in my routine, but figure out a way of, do, of doing it. It was more fun, so I actually did the long tones of pop music, and that actually, I, I end up doing, like, 20 minutes of long tones without even realizing it. Um, so uh, once I get past that point, I do... I, I do scales every single day, every, like starting on pedal B flat, working my way down to B flat, pedal B flat partial, uh, doing three octave scales. I start by glissing them just to sort of get the sound going, and then I articulate them to get the tongue going, and then I'll do lip slurs to get just sort of a little bit of flexibility. But um, another thing that I wanted to sort of bring in today was that uh, was the idea of, of trying to be more detailed <coughs> in your practice. Be more focused on very small elements and then put them back into the puzzle. So for instance, like I said, I, I, gliss, I gliss my scales every single day just, be, just so that I can focus on sound production. Um, I, it's a very simple scale pattern. I've been, doing it, it's, I've been doing it probably for five years, but it's something that I can do every single day to sort of as like a litmus test to say it's like, all right, Am I back to where I should be? Like, what, what do I need to adjust? What's different today? Well, that cheeseburger I ate last night's kind of not feeling so great on my face. So, you know, I can make proper adjustments because I know how that scale is supposed to sound. I know how it sounds on my best day. And I just, if it doesn't sound that way, then I keep doing it until it does sound that way. And usually, you know, when you, when you get really good at making these minor adjustments, you can do it pretty quickly. Eventually, you can just make those minor adjustments. And I feel like I... I don't have many bad days anymore. I mean, they're occasional, you know, but um, I feel like more often I have good day, good day, good day, good day, bad day, good day, good day, good day, instead of the other way around. And it's by figuring out why you have a good day. When you have a good day, why is it, and how can I get back to it? So one thing I do is I start out with pedal B flat. <laughs> so forth going through all the modes um, I like to say going through all the modes because it makes me sound smart but I'm really not thinking of it like that <laughs> I just move up to C and say in the key of B flat but <laughs> it essentially sounds cooler right if you see you're going through the modes so um, I go all the way up uh, to high B flat just making sure that my sound is the exact same and I'm happy with it all the way from pedal B flat all the way up to high B flat and Usually once I get that, I can move on to articulating, and the sound remains. I'm, ab I'm able to articulate with the full sound at the beginning of the note, 
all the way to the end of the note without having to think about it. I don't have to tell myself, hey, brick up your notes a little bit more. You know, it's just, it's there because you're using your air properly. Um, sorry, one thing I meant to mention, and whenever you're doing these, these, uh, these glissing or just any sort of thing um, involving this warm up with glissing, just one airstream. I take a huge breath in as big as I can, and then I just play until I'm out of air. Um, it, it trains you to just do that in the music, and so you're taking less time to breathe, right? The, I'm a firm believer that in music, you, you know, if the composer wanted a break, they would have written one. And so we do all, everything we can to not create space for breathing, because it's not in the line, right? Um, once I do that, I, get, I move on to uh, lip slurs. And basically, what, I, what I'm doing with this is I, I started out by, um, we played this piece at, at UT, what was it, like the, the, the Chief or something like that? It has this one part where it goes down to like tenor, one tenor trombone just going, right? Which one is it? Stardust. All right. And we had this guy there, Graham Gibson, that, they, that Dr. Briggins handed this solo off to, and he started doing this lip and I was just like, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> how can you do that? You know, and it's, it's, it was simple. I asked him, I was like, dude, how do you do it? He's like, well, I just practice it every day. I mean, and it just kind of blew, blew my mind that it's like, it really is that simple, you know? So I started out with, uh, I started doing lip slurs that day, and I, I hated them, so I stopped. Um, and then when I got <laughs> to grad school, naturally, right? Um, then when I got to grad school, um, this guy I was in grad school with, I mean, he was easily the top of our studio at Northwestern, and, uh, and I asked him, I said, so how, like, how much would you say um, lip slurs are a part of your daily routine? And I mean, it, it was a very simple answer. He was like, at least like 70 to 75 percent of my daily routine is dedicated to lip slurs and, you know, moving around them, but just going through the partial. It's like, well, that makes sense. We're an instrument built on partials. We should be really good at that, right? So. Um, I start out with uh, B flat in first position, and basically I don't structure it too much. I just want to get the feeling of moving through the partials and making sure that I know what it feels like to move to slur up to a B flat, slur up to a D, slur up to an F. Um, and it's more about memorizing how it feels so that you can recreate a feeling instead of recreating instructions, right? You don't want to tell yourself, "Oh, okay, so you you pinch the the the, uh, the lips together, you move, you know, you do that with the muscles." You're, you're going to be lost. You know, you're going to be going driving yourself nuts. Try and, try and memorize the way it feels and then recreate a feeling, an overall, um, oops, that'll be the next point, but an overall idea. <laughs> Basically, it, it ends up being something like that to where when I don't like the interval, I just keep doing it until I smooth it out and make it something that I do like. And, uh, and la last point I wanted to make before we get on to um, hearing some of these guys, these excellent players come up, is whenever you're recreating a sound, when you're recreating um, your technique, your air, you know, try and think of it more as a, as a final product. Instead of, all right, I'm going to do this with my air. I'm going to do this with my tongue. I'm going to do this with the inside of the cavity of my mouth. You know, I'm going to do this with my lips. You know, like, it's just way too much. And I feel like a lot of times player get, players get bogged down. It's like, well, whenever I do this line, I've got to do this with my lips. And then I've got to, you know, create an overall feeling. And again, this, this goes back to incorporating music, uh, listening to pop music in my practice and how much it's actually uh, become a part of who I am as a player. But, um, Basically, like I've, I've realized that in, uh, in our many years of practicing, we've created um, physical responses to what we hear, right? Um, this room, for instance, right? It's a lovely resonant room, right? No. Uh, so a lot of times, whenever I first played in here, I heard it, and I started adjusting my playing. I freaked out, and I, like, I caved in. And, you know, it was, um, it's, if, if you haven't played in here, you know, at some point, get up here and just, like, play a few notes. It's just, it just sucks the tone right out. Um, 
and I, and I, I started like adjusting things. Like I started adjusting the way I, I blew the air, the way I, you know, I started just overthinking it instead of just going back to how it feels to play. So um, we've created physical responses to what we hear. And sometimes in order to improve ourselves, we must disable these responses so that we can create new, better ones. So for instance, um, what I, I, I kind of realized this while I was practicing like a coproche etude one day. And every single time I got to this one part, I'd mess it up. And so I eventually started tensing up as I'd get to that part because it was hard for me and I knew I wasn't gonna get it. And the only thing I heard in my head was me failing every single time. So I, I, I sort of realized, I'm like, man, I haven't even played it yet and I've already defeated myself. I've already just like clamped down, my body gets tense, my air slows down, and then it's, well, then it's definitely not gonna happen. So I was like, all right, um, what's the solution here? All right, well, stop listening to myself. Yeah, that, that'd, that'd be nice. I just don't wanna hear myself mess that up. So I, I started putting in headphones just because I was really getting bummed about listening to myself constantly mess something up that I really wanted to be good at. And I eventually started just glissing through it and trying to play it. And I, I, I kept failing at it, but I practiced it more because I didn't hear myself fail at it and it didn't get me down. And so I was able to keep doing it and I was like, wow, all right, I'm actually getting better at this. Surprise, surprise, I practice something and it gets better, right? You know, like it's just repetition will eventually make you a better player if you're doing it the right way and focusing on the right end result. So um, I, I listen to music that's louder than what I'm playing, but I can still hear general pitch, right? Um, I don't hear cracked notes. It's almost like standing behind someone, behind their bell when they're playing or in the next room in an audition. Like everyone sounds awesome in the next room in an audition, right? <laughs> you know, everyone sounds awesome outside the practice room. The open, it's like, well, you actually, you were cracking a lot of notes, but. I'm gonna step back out here because it was good. <laughs> that's what I, that's what I, I hear whenever and I just use earbuds. It's not like um, it, they're not it's noise cancellation or any of that, but just earbuds so that I can still hear outside the headphones. And I remember thinking, I was like, man, I sound really good. Let me take these headphones off. Nope. <laughs> Let me put them back on. And it was it was astonishing to me. But I one of my, my one thought was, it didn't sound perfect yet, but it sounded better than it was before. And I, I, I realized it's like, wow, I'm actually practicing the stuff that I hate to practice because I'm just not letting it, I'm not like failing at it so much and hearing myself constantly fail at it. Um, but basically, whenever I was doing it, I was also realizing that by not listening to myself and creating those physical responses to the, to my, the oral input from the trombone, I wasn't tensing up anymore. And I was relaxing and I was actually letting my body learn you know it was learning all right how to do that arpeggio or how to do that lip slur in a relaxed state just as i want to perform it and um i i've learned that in doing this that when it eventually when it feels right it sounds right you know i i would i would play the same arpeggio over and over and after like a couple weeks of doing this i was like okay i think i'm ready to hear what this sounds like you know it it, it feels right i don't feel a cracked note in there i don't feel like i'm missing anything and sure enough i took the headphones out and i was it sounded great. I was like, holy, holy cow, I've never sounded like that in my life. So I, I eventually just started doing that on, on everything I practiced, on all my excerpts and on, on everything. And it just, everything started getting a little bit better, a little bit better. And I actually would end a practice session happy. And I'd go home and be like, man, that oh, was productive. All right. And uh, regardless of how it sounded, um, I didn't get down. And I came the next day thinking I was awesome, even though, I think the headphones out, probably, probably wasn't that awesome at the time. And, but the, just the idea that I was going to the horn, ready to practice, and I was happy about it, I was willing, I was motivated. And that's, I mean, it's so crucial to have that motivation whenever you're picking the horn up and really trying to, trying to conquer something that's been an uphill battle. So um, basically, that's sort of uh, a lot of my uh, ideologies as a player and, and, and in, my pr in the practice room, what I really cling to, to um, sort of keep me going on a daily basis. But um, I, I'd like to welcome up our first performer for you guys, uh, Stephen Clayton. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you real quick. What are you playing for us today, Stephen? Uh, Bach 
Kelly Street, number five, Sarah Bond. Great. Thank you. So I want to point out something that, that Stephen did really, really well. Um, a lot of things you did really, really well, but one thing that, that really caught my ear was your sound, right? Right away, great sound, okay? And that I, I can see that it's directly related to the way he breathes. Did you guys notice how he took that first breath? Did I mean, it was it was dark, it was heavy, it was it was low pit, low in pitch, right? And that's that will directly result in the sound that comes out the instrument. You know, uh, if any of you guys caught the Megumi Kanda uh, masterclass the other day, she's sort of sort of saying the same thing. If you take a, if you take a breath, it's <sighs> right. What's going to come out? Ah, right. You know, but if you take a lower breath, <sighs> you're gonna you're setting up your muscles, you're setting up your throat, the in, in, our, in the uh, the cavity of your mouth, to stay that way when you play. Okay. So first off, great sound, very nice legato, very beautiful. Um, it's very beautiful all around, right? Um, a couple things I want to work on. So you're playing with the time a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, when you do that, what what are, what are you following? Are you following sort of just like uh, like an inner musical gut? Or is it a, is it planned out? Um, some of it is uh, just inner musical, uh, what I feel, and then a lot of it is planned out, like some of the some of the sequence measures I push a little yeah, pull push a little bit and then coming off of them I pull back on the time yeah. a little bit okay great and I and I liked a lot of things you did but let's make it better right mm -hmm. um, are you subdividing throughout this in your head yes throughout the whole time though um, or at least the, at not. least when you're playing with the time yes. okay um, something that's really important it would like Time is sort of uh, one of those sacred elements of trombone playing that, um, you know, it, it, when you're not, you're either in the pocket or you're not in the pocket whenever it comes to time, you know, and um, I'm being picky right now, but basically when you decide to play with the time, you decide to push it forward and pull it back, you need to be doing it in the most organic, po organic way possible, you know, and the best way to control that is by subdividing, you know, that whenever you push the time forward a little bit, that it's even, that you're pushing it forward, that it doesn't just suddenly lurch forward or lurch back, you know what I mean? But it's, it gradually goes forward in a beautiful fashion, comes back in a beautiful fashion, when it's not marked, right? I'm not talking about different tempo markings. I'm talking about when there's one tempo marking and you're playing with the time, right? So always keep that subdivision in your head so that you, know, you can have those, those retards be very metered and even. 
And you'd be surprised that as a listener, whenever we hear these, you know, when you hear a perfect retard or a perfect Acella Rondo, it just, you don't, you don't notice it. It just sounds good and it feels good to hear it. You know what I mean? But the moment I notice you playing with time, it means you're doing it wrong. Yeah. You know what I mean? Okay, yeah. So play with it in a way that, play with the time in a way that no one notices just because it's so perfectly even going forward and perfectly even coming back. Um, second thing, can you just start at the top for us one more time? Play um, four bars. Okay, great. Um, a couple of things. So you, in this excerpt, and again, I'm gonna be really picky about it because it, I've, I've I've worked on this one a lot to the point where I've I'm super picky about myself with it. And so I've, I've sort of made these mistakes as well. Um, a lot of times we will, like, coming up to that last C, we know, okay, I need air for it. So what you did, probably without noticing it, is you took a breath, played two notes, and took another breath, played two notes, and then went to the C, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, it's like you, you, end up, you end up breaking the music up a lot mm -hmm. to show sort of a human weakness that, when overcome, can actually sort of put you above the next person right mm -hmm. it's just one of those little steps right so my whenever I'm playing things like this in and uh, something where if, if has everybody seen the music for this no rests right 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 yeah. <laughs> no rests. so you have to create your own rests in order to breathe right and, and the way I think about it is the fewer the better and the maximum amount of air in the smallest smallest space possible right so you want to you want to do your breathing exercises in a fashion to where you can get a massive amount of air in the smallest amount of space so that you don't have to take multiple breaths going through. And you can, you can create these longer phrases. Um, I want to point out something that he's doing very well. A lot of times people play this excerpt. Be da ba da bum. Be da ba da bum. Right? They play it in pairings. And um, there's actually there's a pivot note in each one of these. It's dee da 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 bum. The third note. It's, a, it's sort of a pivot note between you're going down and then you pivot back up to go down. So you get these two groupings of note, two groupings of notes. And if you really study this long enough, it sort of has that, uh, that um, dual purpose there. Of it. it belongs to the first group and the second group, essentially making it all one grouping. Um, and when you do it this way, you allow yourself to create these bigger phrases, not just ba da ba da ba, ba da ba da ba. But da da di da ya da da di da 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 di da di di da da di bomb right think more four bar phrases with a lot of this stuff um so another little picky thing with the intonation anytime that you're that you're out and i'm sure you'll probably get a recording of this you'll hear you're generally low on the low side so just something to think about with this one i um this is another one that in order to in order to get it consistent every time I would just I'd walk around it was when I was over, uh, over at the Navy band they had this huge thing called the sail off where we rehearse and I would just walk around just mindlessly playing this over and over and over and over and over again to where it just became muscle memory you know this is one of those excerpts I feel like it's just it should be in your pocket right mm -hmm. and and you do you have it very well mastered but to get it like every single time Repetition, right? Practice the consistency. Whenever play a phrase, if you got every note, good. Don't celebrate. Just move on to the next phrase, right? Mm -hmm. um, great. Can you start right here for me, please?
Thanks, Stephen. Uh, I think we've got another uh, Ryan. Is Ryan here? Ryan, let's give me a hand to Ryan. He's got the Concerto Allegro by Lebedev today. Um, you want to just do down to the end of the first yeah. page? Thank you. Okay, so I just wanted to, a couple of things on this one. Really nice little range. I'm, I, I love how, like, whenever you get down to the pedal register, it just stays open. It stays, it, it just, it, it sounds like everything is just flexed open, right? And, and relax, okay? Um, I want to just touch on a few things that we can improve, you know? So, uh, how much of your routine, daily routine would you say you dedicate to breathing and breathing exercises? Not much. <laughs> Not much. Is there a reason just because in general it's just not fun, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it sucks. It does, you know. <laughs> you know, and a lot of time it's lack of direction, you know, like a lot of times um I before I got this this book I'm about to mention, um I I knew I needed to do breathing exercises, but I never did them because I was like, well, all right, what am I going to do? I I feel like I'm pretty good at breathing. I'm still alive, you know, like, <laughs> all right. Yeah, you know, and, and so I did, but I didn't have, like, good exercises, and I didn't have exercises that would directly equate to something in the music or something in my playing. It's like, all right, I did that breathing exercise. It's great. Uh, all right, what am, I so am I supposed to notice something different, right? Um, there's this book out there called The Breathing Gym. If you guys haven't, haven't purchased this book or haven't ever heard of this book, go get it today. Um, I guarantee you, like, it's... Um, Two guys out, it's Sam Palafian and Patrick Sheridan, Patrick Sheridan thank you, um, out in California. And it's, one thing I loved about this book and I really started using it a lot is because it actually tells you when doing this exercise, this is what you can notice in your playing, right? So one thing that I think that you would really benefit from doing some of these breathing exercises is stabilizing your sound on the long notes. 
you have a great airstream whenever you're playing legato. It's it's very consistent and it's very it just it stays moving the entire time. But the moment you sit on a longer note, it tends to fluctuate, right? So one of the breathing exercises that directly relates to that, in my opinion, is um, I, I do this one. I start every day. I'll start with in for four counts, out for four counts, four times, right? So let's do that together, right? When you're doing this, stand feet shoulder width apart and just keep your body relaxed, okay? And have you seen them do this right here? Like where you put yeah, your, yeah. right, let's use this. Basically what, I don't know what they call this. So I just look kind of dumb being like, do this. But <laughs> it's basically you're wanting to hear the lowest pitch possible as the air rushes past your hand. So if you're hearing, you're doing it wrong, right? You want to hear, wrong. Right, something as low as you possibly can. Drop the jaw, get the teeth open, and bring in as much warm air as possible, right? So we're going to do this up to four, in for four, out for four, right? Four times. One, two, ready, and. So a couple things to focus on while you're doing that. That was four, right? Is that four? I think so. Okay. Um, a couple things to focus on while you're doing that is whenever you get to the sort of the top 20% of your lung capacity, first of all, that's with the assumption that you're breathing from the bottom to the top, right? When you get to that top 20%, that's usually the portion that people just kind of give up on. They're like, ah, it's, it's hard. I'll just leave it alone. No one can really do that, right? No, you, you got to open that up. So as you get higher, feel more relaxed, right? Your body's going to want to tense up. But tell your body, it's, it's fine. Just relax your shoulders and actually utilize that top 20% because that's what's going to get you those longer phrases, right? Mm -hmm. So I do this exercise. We're going to do, oh, I guess we, we don't have to do it. But I do four in, four out. And then I'll, and then I'll do four quick breaths. So I'll go. <laughs> right? Trying to fill all the way up, 100% bottom to top, OK? And then on the fi on the I'll do it on the fourth one, I hold it for four counts, breathe one more in for five. So I'll go. And then to relax. I do that sequence starting with fours, then going with fives, all the way up to ten. And what you're gonna notice is that your long notes will eventually start to iron out. You know, whenever you get to um, for instance, the beginning, be ba 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 be ba bom. You'll get that first note, just be ba. It'll be, it, there will be no um, wavering in the beginning or the end of the sound. Okay. Um, another little trick that I want you to try for me. Take the horn, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna blow through the horn as fast as we can, and then I'm gonna have you play the, uh, play it at the top. Okay. So. Basically, put both tr both valves down, okay. Make sure they don't spit in there. And we're gonna blow through it 16 times. Okay. Bear with me for just a minute. It's gonna take just a little bit, but you're gonna do it 16 times. If you feel like you're getting dizzy, stop. Right. Okay. But as big a breath as possible, as fast through the horn as possible. And then when you feel ready, just go ahead and start on your own. Okay. In and out as quick as you can. Ready, and. better or worse ah, better. Yeah, way better. right so this exercise is not it's not gonna last your entire practice session it's gonna last for like five minutes right 
and then you're back, you're back to your, yourself of not doing breathing exercises every day again. <laughs> but basically, <laughs> sorry, that came out really <laughs> mean. That was a total dick thing to say. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, way to go, Brian. Um, but basically, it shows you what you can accomplish if you do do breathing exercises every day, right? It gets you sort of, it gives you that boost and shows you, um, like, all right, this is, I just sort of gave my lungs a jump start, right? And your phrases were so much smoother. I thought that the line was there through every single note, and it was more stable, right? And so let that motivate you, right? See what you are, what you are capable of, and then let it bother you whenever you don't get it. Right? Whenever you go home and practice, if you haven't done your breathing exercises and you can't recreate that feeling, be bothered by it. Be bothered to the point where you're like, all right, I'm going to do some breathing exercises. And then you do them and then you come back to this and you get that again. And then you realize, all right, if I did this every single day, I could sound like this all the time. Right? And then you essentially just took yourself to the next level. Right? Um, we, we've got to move on to the next player, but thank you so much for playing. Yeah, thank you. Sounds great. Who's up in the next player? <laughs> it's coming. Chris? Is it Chris? Chris! Sorry about that. Thanks. Just winning on, on, on all levels today. What do you have to play for us? <laughs> excerpts, no, excerpts, good. Yeah, that was good. That's good. Um, how many do you have? Uh, mainly just like the four thing. The first round of STS stuff. STS, what's that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Southeast Trombone Symposium. That's okay, great. So um, what do you have? Schumann 4? Yeah, then Lohengrin, Raymarch, and uh, Baker Hammond. Great. All right, well, choose whichever one you want. about this a little bit. Um, right from the get-go, do you, what do you have going through your head? Uh, time. Time. All right, so is it, like, is it a metronome? Is it a recording? Um, I, I don't know. I'm kind of just thinking quarters. Just thinking quarters. Yeah. Okay. Um, something that I also use a lot in my practice, and I use this with auditions, and, it, and it's, it's been really helpful for me, but it's something that I sort of developed. Um, basically, so Whenever you're, whenever you're preparing to play, for an, play an excerpt, right, whether it be in practice or on stage at the audition, you need to have a recording going. You need to have it queued up in your mind, right? And how are you going to have that if you don't have, like, a listening list? So this, I'll, I'll use this, this is a great time to actually talk about auditions just for a little bit. So whenever I gear up for auditions, I start about two months in advance, right? And I make two books, right? I make a book for me and a book for, uh, for, for my peers to for whenever I'm playing for them, that they can, they can, they can look at it and actually make markings, and, and you know they, they actually have something to look at. Um, which brings us to the second point: play for people a lot, right? Yeah. Um, but the other thing I do, make a paper book of it. But the second thing I do is I make a listening list, right? I queue up all these excerpts. I, I find about 20 seconds before to about like five, 10 seconds after, and I listen to these things on repeat. And it sucks because I've heard this thing like a million times. I don't want to listen to it again, but the thing is, I'm ingraining into my brain something that I call sound tagging. Is that what I call it? Yes, <laughs> sound tagging. Um, basically, it's something that whenever you, um, the human brain often will pair 
senses together, right? You see something on the TV, you can almost taste it. You see, you, you see uh, your part to a piece of music. You know, whenever I look at this, I can hear the recording start up, right? And it's just sort of like subconscious. It just happens because over time, every time I've pulled this out, I connect that, that visual image to that sound, right? And I have one recording I listen to all the time for each of these excerpts. And so it's, it's essentially tagged that sound to the image of this excerpt so that every time I flip to it on stage, whether it be in practice or performance, I flip to it, soundtrack just starts up, okay? Mm -hmm. And the soundtrack's in time, right? Mm -hmm. So don't think about a metronome. Think about the recording. It's going to be in time. Think about being on stage in the moment performing this piece, right? Um, the, the first couple bars of this are sort of, you know, if, if you don't have that music going along with you, you're just sort of playing the notes, mm -hmm. you know, and that'll really only get you so far in an audition. Um, you know, you play all the right notes in tune and with a good sound, you know, if you do really well, you'll advance to finals. Well, what I've learned by um, my own successes and by successes of others is that the people, and, and just sort of picking their brains about it, the people that win these auditions are not the people who present the right notes at the audition. It's the people who present the right music at the audition. Like, you are playing Wagner, right? Not just playing the notes he wrote down, okay? And that it's, it's so easy to do that whenever you have this sound tag of every time you see this, you're in character. You're in, you're in the character of the piece, and you're ready to go. It's started, and you're just playing along with whoever you've got in your head, New York Philharmonic, Chicago Symphony, whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you're just joining along and, and you're playing that piece. Um, kind of hard, hard to do that right now. I was actually going to never do it again. But um, how about, all right, let's, so let's move on to the next thing. Uh, next thing I was going to talk about, articulation on these, on these lower notes. Um, do you triple tongue those or do you single tongue them? Triple. Triple, okay. So, Basically, we, we need to clean those up a little bit, right? And a quick way of doing that is um, one thing I've learned about this excerpt in particular is that instead of trying to remember like what what I need to do with my air, what I need to do with my tongue and all that stuff, I just memorize how it feels to play each one of those notes. Mm -hmm. And then I sort of, whenever the time comes, tell my body, like, do those three feelings in a row. So let's start with this first triplet, right? D major. Just play a D for me. We're, we're going to go back and forth, right? Low one, yeah. Forget what I'm doing, just play it and, and let it feel, play it the way, the way it feels best to play it for you, right? A natural. Okay? It's fine, it's fine. <laughs> Basically, the, what I'm, the point I'm getting at is I start this slow, and I get each note to sound great on its own, right? So that I can come back to it and sort of just like cutting and pasting. It's like, well, I know how to play a D really great by itself. I can play the F sharp really great by itself. The A really great by itself. But it's, I mean, that, that's not sort of what you're, quizzed on, so to say, at the audition, you have to play them all together. But the idea is that you just sort of cut and you paste them right next to each other so that you have three great sounding notes, ta ta ta, -ta right, leading to that fourth C. Um, so you memorize how that feels, and then you start putting them together, right? <laughs> It takes time, but you eventually get there where you just get it faster and faster and faster, right? Until you're getting three like images, sort of, of your greatest D you've ever played, your greatest F sharp, your greatest A you've ever played, mm -hmm. all together, okay? Instead of playing it and be like, oh, the F sharp was okay, but I feel pretty good about it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, it, it which brings brings me to my next point: have the whenever you're doing these excerpts, you've got to beat guys out there that are practicing like four hours a day. 
So you've got to be the guy that practices five hours a day, right? Yeah. Um, but basically, you've got to be the guy that <coughs> brings the most detail to the audition, you know? The most nuance, the most characteristic, char characteristically, sorry, characteristically correct details about this, right? So whenever you're separating all these notes, make sure that the character is there, right? Um, for instance, on this one, whenever we have that triplet leading up to the C, we want it, ya ta ta ta, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll back it up and do that slowly. practicing that like in dynamics, like sort of echelon dynamics, right? Um, do you have the top octave ready too? Or? I mean, I can do it. You can say it. Oh, yeah, I'm just curious. Um, <laughs> all right. Can we do, um, let's start. Can you play that one more time? And I want you to think about a few things when you're doing this. One, this room's tough to play in, right? Mm -hmm. It's sort of, your, your sound just sort of drops off. Regardless of what room you're put in at an audition, you have to play the way you play in the best space you've ever played in, right? So imagine you're not in here, okay? Imagine that you're in Boston Symphony Hall, standing in the middle of the stage, and it's just, it's gonna resonate anything you put out there, and, it, and you're just gonna blow right through the horn, free blowing, okay? Try this one more time at the top. Bring it up a couple dynamics, play some down here. How about it? Hear, hear the recording as you play, right? listen to it every single day mm -hmm. right great job thanks so I guess I gotta wrap it up <laughs> um, basically I just want to leave you guys with a couple of, a couple of thoughts um, I didn't get to talk a whole lot about auditions as much as I wanted to but if, if you guys have any questions about that just feel free to email me or um, or find me in the hallway or something but um, Basically, a a as you practice and as you get older, obviously you get out of school and you've, you don't have someone sort of hounding you anymore. You don't have a teacher. You don't have to report to anybody on a weekly basis. You just report to yourself, right? And so what's so important is that whenever you get out of school and you're still working to win that job or win that teaching job or, or get, the, get the better gigs, right, beat someone out for a gig or whatever, that you're always remembering to, to continue the advancement of your playing to work on the details, never be happy with good enough. Never be happy with like, w this, is, this is what I've got and uh, it, it's been pretty good, it's been working for me. No, always try to be better. Imagine the perfect like trombone sound in your head and think to yourself, all right, how am I, how, what am I doing that, like, what it, so like, I'll break it down for what I do. Uh, Charlie Vernon is like my mentor, that guy is who I, like, I wanna, be, I wanna play like. And so growing up, I constantly thought, all right, well, what is he doing that I'm not? What is Randy Hawes doing that, that I'm not? Whenever I was, you know, I in school and stuff, so I got both their CDs, and I learned every solo on it. And I was like, all right, he, he's, he just sounds better on that lick than I do. Why? Right? And it, it was the details. I was playing the same notes as him. I was playing them in tune and in time, and I thought it was pretty good sound, but it just didn't sound right. It didn't sound the same as him. And so you really got to focus on the details in your own playing and never, and, and never just be happy. You, I mean, you can be happy, but <laughs> you can be happy. But, you know, always, always want to better yourself. Um, stay hungry for practice and figuring out the trombone. And, it, and with hard work, success will find you. So anyway, thank you guys so much for coming to this master class and listening to me talk about trombone.